Committee on Education and the Workforce will come to order. I note that a quorum is present. Without objection, the chair is authorized to call a recess at any time. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing. On my first day as chairwoman of the Committee on Education and the Workforce, this Congress, I made a promise to officials in the Biden administration, think about investing in a parking space on Capitol Hill. You'll be here often. That's because I see congressional oversight as a primary duty of the committee. Secretary Cardona, I'm pleased you're the first administration official to make your statutorily mandated half-mile pilgrimage to the committee this Congress. Candidly, Mr. Speak Mr. Secretary, I wish we could have you appear before us more often. In lieu of your presence, I've directed no less than 11 oversight letters to the Department of Education since the 118th Congress began. My first letter notified you of the Department's obligation to provide timely and complete responses to committee oversight requests. Mr. Secretary, I wish this hearing was an endorsement of your Department's cooperation with our request so we could then proceed in good faith to the FY 2024 budget request. Instead, the Department has engaged in disingenuous and misleading actions while being minimally responsive to congressional oversight. Article 1 vests the power of the purse in the Congress. James Madison wrote in Federalist 58 that, quote, this power over the purse may, in fact, be regarded as the most complete and effectual weapon with which any constitution can arm the immediate representatives of the people for obtaining a redress of every grievance and for carrying into effect every just and salutary measure, end quote. Therefore, before turning to the budget proposal for which you're here to advocate, I'd like to lay out the concerns from this committee of the people's elected representatives to which the department has been derelict in responding. Mr. Secretary, the department has repeatedly attempted to circumvent the constitutional authority of Congress by legislating the president's student debt scheme through executive fiat. Six times the department extended its pause on student loan payments. Each time, American families scrambled to prepare for the restart of loan payments while education bureaucrats left them in the dark until the 11th hour. The American taxpayer has paid $175 billion for the repayment moratorium. It must end. Then, Mr. Secretary, the department proposed a radical alteration to the income-driven repayment plan. This backdoor attempt to drive through the president's free college agenda will cost the American people at least $230 billion over the next decade. Finally, Mr. Secretary, on top of that, the department is attempting to provide nearly two-thirds of the benefit to those in the top half of the income spectrum. Not only has blanket cancellation been rejected by the courts, renounced by nearly all economists, and even balked at by former Obama officials, it defies logic. <laughs> Student debt cancellation, as written, is a regressive policy that benefits the top half of earners disproportionately and forces degreeless blue-collar workers to pay for PhDs. The three policies comprising the president's student debt scheme would cost the American taxpayers upwards of $1 trillion. Meanwhile, the federal government is $32 trillion in debt. So each borrowed dollar comes out of workers' paychecks through the inflationary tax. I wrote February 10th, 27th, and April 25th regarding these issues and have yet to receive a satisfactory answer. Furthermore, Mr. Secretary, the Department acts as one of the main proponents of this administration's culture war on the American people. 
Your job is to administer faithfully the laws enacted by Congress, not misuse those laws to indoctrinate. Yet the department has radically rewritten Title IX so that sex is defined as an ideological construction rather than a biological reality. Under your department's regime, self-identification is deemed sufficient for a man to be a legal woman and therefore compete in women's sports. And one could self-identify as a man on one day and a woman the very next day. What a reductive surface level view of womanhood. Frankly, I've yet to hear you define what a woman is, yet you propose sweeping rules to redefine women as a class. Mr. Secretary, I wish I could say the pervasive progressive ideology championed by your department has stayed in university lecture halls where students are mature enough to debate the concepts but it has trickled down to K-12 schooling. Your department recently announced it would give priority to history and civics grants for school programs that promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. Also, and not coincidentally, recent NAEP data reveal that under your watch, history scores for eighth graders have hit record lows, the worst since the assessment began in 1994. Our country was built on the guiding principles of liberty and natural rights, yet left-wing history teachings tear down our founding by ignoring the good for the bad and ascribing collective guilt to whole populations for the actions of their ancestors. Aside from dumbing down a whole generation, this radical new history is aimed at subverting our national story as an imperfect people collectively bound by higher ideals. Finally, Mr. Secretary, let us not forget the COVID-19 pandemic. By prolonging school closures at the behest of teachers unions, your department made the single greatest education policy failure in our nation's history. You let students lose 20 years of progress in core curricula like math, reading, and history. It didn't take a scientific study to tell you that remote learning would crush K-12 progress. All it took was listening to parents. If COVID proved one thing, it's that writing a blank check for education is not the answer. We effectively turned the department into a bank during the pandemic, sending 190 billion out the door to K-12 schools. We know how that turned out. Those funds have been used to push the administration's ideological agenda, such as subsidizing LGBTQ plus cultural competencies in California. Your department refused to conduct proper oversight over COVID relief funds. So on April 3rd, my committee stepped in and requested documents and accountability. We have yet to receive satisfactory response. That is the thrust of your department's action this past year. Now let me quickly turn to the FY 2024 budget proposal. Ironically, this administration is trying to justify a $10.8 billion increase in discretionary spending for the Department of Education from the FY 2023 level. Earlier, I called the half mile to Capitol Hill a pilgrimage because I feel that is exactly how administration officials view it. This building is foreign to them officials shy from oversight and accountability instead of treating it as their sacred duty to answer elected representatives. We want answers. We want answers for parents left in the dark. Children put a generation behind. Women athletes being discriminated against and the American taxpayer left with the bill. That should be the starting point for any budget discussion. With that, I yield to the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Dr. Fox. And before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that tomorrow is the 69th anniversary of the Brown v. Board of Education decision. In that decision, Chief Justice wrote that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate, but separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Now, almost 70 years later, the Americans' public schools 
are as segregated by race and class today as they were in the late 1960s. According to a Government Accountability Office report last year, more than a third of public school students attend a racially segregated school. Tomorrow, I will reintroduce legislation, the Strength and Diversity Act and the Equity and Inclusion Enforcement Act, to meaningfully address school segregation and finally realize the promise of Brown. Uh, now, Mr. Secretary, good morning, and thank you for being with us today. I'm pleased to state that under your leadership, the Biden-Harris administration has helped restore the department's commitment to supporting public schools, supporting students, and supporting educators. Two years ago, as the chair pointed out, we secured the largest one-time federal investment in K-12 education in our nation's history in the American Rescue Plan, which made it possible for schools to reopen safely, stay open safely, address learning loss, and respond to students' mental and social-emotional needs. And we ensured that the greatest resources went to those with the greatest need. This administration has forgiven more than $38 billion in student loan debt for 1.75 million borrowers, including loan borrowers who were defrauded by their institutions. And it has helped provide borrowers with a clear pathway to repayment by improving the public, public service loan forgiveness program and the income-driven repayment program. Department has also helped protect student safety and civil rights by updating Title IX rule and issuing new guidance to protect students with disabilities from discriminatory discipline practices. These are just some of the key steps the Department, under this administration, has taken to deliver for students and educators. And today, we look forward to hearing more about how the President's budget proposals will build on this progress. It is often said that a budget proposal is a statement of values. The investments we choose to make or choose not to make are a clear way for the American people to see whether their elected officials are putting their taxpayers' money where their mouths are. The President's budget proposal reflects a continued commitment to expanding access to high-quality education at every level. And here are just a few examples. The proposal shows up funding to help underserved schools close achievement gaps and sustain programs that are helping students recover from the pandemic. To lower the cost of college, the budget proposes $820 in increased maximum Pell Grant, as well as a down payment towards free community college. And it boosts funding for career and technical education, which is critical for our economy. These investments will be transformational for our educational system. Regrettably, my Republican colleagues have chosen to use their time in the majority to pursue policies that harm students and roll back the clock on our progress. Last month, the House Republicans passed a bill that makes devastating cuts to programs for our students and educators. It eliminates billions of dollars for schools serving low-income students, equivalent to removing more than 60,000 educators and staff from classrooms. The proposal reduces funding for support of, for, for as many as 7.5 million students with disabilities. And it makes college more expensive by eliminating Pell Grants for 80,000 students and reducing the maximum award for the remaining 6.6 .6 million recipients. Finally, it eliminates badly needed student debt relief for more than 40 million eligible borrowers. Our nation's students and educators deserve better. We should be working together to address the urgent challenges in education, such as rebuilding and modernizing school infrastructure, addressing achievement gaps, protecting student civil rights, and lowering the cost of college for current and future borrowers. Committee Democrats have introduced and will continue to introduce legislation that will take key steps towards these goals. And simply put, when we invest in education, students can succeed. So thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your time and for your work to help every student access a high-quality education. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Pursuant to Committee Rule 8C, all members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m., 14 days after the date of the hearing which is May 30, 2023. And without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 14 days. 
to allow such statements and other extraneous materials referenced during the hearing to be submitted for the official record. I now turn to the introduction of our distinguished witness. We have before us today the Honorable Miguel Cardona, who's Secretary of the U.S. Department of Education. Secretary Cardona, I recognize you for your verbal statement. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Fox, Ranking Member Scott, and distinguished members of the committee. I'm pleased to join you today to testify on behalf of President Biden's fiscal year 2024 budget request for the Department of Education. I often say that investing in our children is as important as investing in our defense. It protects our future. It strengthens our society. It reinforces the prosperity of our country, our economy, and the power of our example around the world. This budget request is about whether we choose to invest in that future for our children and for our nation. We can choose to invest in giving our children a strong foundation for learning right away by expanding high quality preschool for more four-year-olds across America. We can choose to invest in a better education for our students in Title I schools, where they can learn the fundamentals of reading, math, and other rigorous subjects they'll need to succeed in life, because those schools are able to tailor instruction and use data to provide one-on-one -on -one support thanks to $2.2 billion in additional funding. We can choose to invest in guaranteeing that our students will have highly qualified teachers with years of experience because we worked early to fully prepare, develop, and empower a strong and diverse educator workforce. We can choose to invest in better learning conditions for our students with another half billion dollars to advance our goal of doubling the number of counselors, the number of social workers, mental health providers available to our students. And we can choose to double the funding for full service community schools that help our students get wraparound support from their own community. Crucially, Madam Chairwoman, I know we have a lot of common ground on this. We can choose to invest in pathways to careers and skills to compete and succeed in a strong economy. This budget would deliver more funding for career and technical education, more funds to create career-connected high schools, and more investments in helping every student become multilingual. We can also choose to invest in making sure post-secondary education is inclusive and affordable for the many Americans who will benefit from a college credential or degree. That means increasing Pell Grants. It means investing in proven strategies that help students better afford college and succeed in earning a degree. It means supporting our HBCUs, our TCUs, and our MSIs. It means making Universal Community College a reality nationwide. So we have a choice to give our students. We have a choice to give them more, not less, with this budget. We have a choice to go back to a broken status quo or to raise the bar for education together. As we consider this budget request, let's appreciate that even as we respectfully disagree in some areas, we all believe passionately in the importance of giving our young people a brighter future. Let's acknowledge that we have many areas of common ground, from wanting our children to have a strong foundation in reading and math, to seeking more skills and career pathways for our young people. The choice we face now is whether we're going to build on common ground that we have to invest in our children or protect a broken status quo that is failing too many of our students. Now is not the time to break down in partisan or divisive culture wars. Now is the time to choose to come together on behalf of the students, parents, and educators who are looking to us to serve and raise the bar for education in this country. Working together, I know we can and we will. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for staying within the time. Um, I now, un under Committee Rule 9, we will now question witnesses under the five-minute rule. I will start by asking 
uh, questions. Mr. Secretary, as I read through your statement, I saw only a passing reference to the restart of loan payments. You said the department was requesting $2.65 billion to administer FSA programs, quote, to support students and student loan borrowers as they navigate the financial aid application and student loan repayment processes. I and subcommittee chairman Owens wrote you on April 25th asking 12 questions about the readiness of the department and FSA for the restart. We've not received any answers. And last week in your testimony before the Senate Appropriations Committee, you said the department is preparing to restart federal student loan payments. <clears throat> Will you commit to no more extensions of the pay repayment pause? Thank you, Chairwoman Fox. Uh, as you know, the one-time targeted debt relief uh, plan that uh, President Biden proposed will provide up to 43 million Americans with some much needed relief, but we recognize that uh, the loan payment will be restarting. And as we said in the past, the Supreme Court decision, which we're eagerly awaiting, we feel positive that it's going to be uh, a positive outcome. And you uh, know I'm under a time constraint, so yes. I'd like you to get real specific, mm -hmm. okay? So are you going to pause anymore the repayment? We uh, communicated that after the Supreme Court decision is made, uh, loan repayments will start within 60 days of the okay. decision. So what are the specific interim and final action steps you've advised loan servicers to take in preparation for the restart? We are in communication regularly with loan servicers and we recognize that part of the success of the repayment plan will be uh, based on how our borrowers receive information in a timely way, in a clear way, and we've engaged with our uh, servicers to ensure that so that's the So how many written communications explaining the details of the restart has the department had with loan servicers from January of this year to the present? Sure, my team is uh, engaging with yours to provide that information and we'll, we'll make sure that that information gets to you in a responsible have, way. Have either you or Mr. Cordray spoken directly with the loan servicers about the restart any time during the period January 2023 through the present? Uh, as I said, the information that you requested will be provided and it will answer uh, who from the department has communicated. And, and will that include sufficient information about sufficient compensation for the student loan servicers to have the capacity to return to repayment? Will you include that? I will uh, ensure that my team has this information uh, that you're requesting. And uh, while I don't have the information in front of me now, I'll tell you that we'll continue to act in okay. good faith to be responsive. Is, isn't it true you've cut the service levels provided by servicers and the funding they receive by amending their current contracts while at the same time you've extended those contracts during through December 2024? Is that true? Chairwoman Fox, part of the request that we have here is to provide sufficient funding to make sure that we can provide good service to our borrowers. Uh, and we feel that this budget reflects our attempt to make sure that we're providing good service to our borrowers through their servicers. Mr. Secretary, um, this act of Congress that established the Department of Education included the finding that, quote, parents have the primary responsibility for the education of their children, and states and localities and private institutions have the primary responsibility for supporting that parental role. You agree, don't you, that teachers, administrators, and school boards should defer to parents as the primary teachers of their children and teachers, administrators, and school boards should support parents, not undercut them and work against them. Is that correct? You know, as a former school principal, I would, I would always tell parents at graduations, you are the first and most influential teachers. I, I say we play a supporting cast, and the schools that are most effective are those that honor and engage parents in a meaningful way. Okay. On a related point, I note that a report released in March of this year by the Defense of Freedom Institute found that eight of the nation's 20 largest school districts allow students to use names and pronouns at school aligned with their gender identity without parental knowledge and consent. Yet some of these same districts included New York City Department of Education, LA Unified School District, Chicago Public Schools require parental permission to dispense over-the-counter medications. Mr. Secretary, you agree, don't you, that school districts that allow students to use names and pronouns in school align with their gender identity without parent, parental knowledge and consent undercuts parents? 
As I said before, uh, Chairwoman, it's critical that uh, schools and parents are, are engaged together in supporting children, and decisions like that are made at the local level. The federal government doesn't have a role in that. Thank, Thank you. you again, Mr. Secretary. I now recognize the ranking member for I'm his Mr. Gerhal is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, uh, and welcome. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Good to see you again. Uh, the discussion on, on the proposed budget by the Biden administration is, a, is an investment on top of an investment, and it is a good strategy. And, and but, but my question. Uh, Dr. Carmona has to do with the Republican budget, or, or the illusion of a budget, uh, which calls for a 22 percent cut, uh, even on the 22 on the on the 22 levels, based on base, and that and based also on the premise that the military would not be touched at all. <clears throat> and I, I asked the question because I I think it's important to contrast this investment budget that you are bringing before the committee today uh, versus uh, what is a budget that devastates Title I, devastates uh, all the support and supplemental services, especially to our most vulnerable students. Speak to that point. Speak to the point, I think, as well, uh, Mr. Secretary. There's a demographic shift going on in our public education system across the country. It's reflected where, in the area I represent. And not only, not only the diversity in terms of race and ethnicity, but also uh, poor, poor kids being the, the bulk in some areas of who is attending public education. And why this investment is important to that transition that this country is going through in our public schools and why these proposed cuts, how they devastate this and why that de cutting those programs at this time to those populations, uh, what it means to our country going forward. Sir? Thank you, Congressman Lehavla. And, um, you know, as a, as a lifelong educator, uh, I've been able to see how these dollars, these federal dollars, help students who are uh, most in need. You mentioned Title I. Uh, students who are struggling to read, uh, we have work to do in this country to get our students reading at the level they should be reading. There's no reason in this country we're not leading the world. Um, our plan is aimed at addressing the literacy and numeracy and uh, the achievement of students in many other areas. So I've seen the impacts of Title I dollars, for example. I've seen the impact of the IDEA dollars uh, for our students. And quite frankly, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, cuts in these areas would negatively impact those students who need it most. Uh, for example, it would result in, a 22% cut would result in approximately 60,000 teachers being cut from Title I dollars uh, across the country. Our students cannot afford that. For students that are uh, students with disabilities, stu I would argue these students has, have probably been impacted the most by the pandemic because they didn't have access to the small group setting, the one-to-one -one, uh, device support that they often receive, uh, we would see a cut of 48,000 teachers under IDEA. Uh, it, it would have a, a negative impact on our entire country, but I think the impact would be most felt by those in greatest need. And, and uh, I have other questions having to do with Title I that you responded to, the 22% funding cut, questions about middle school and its importance in our system. Uh, American Indian and Alaska Native education, um, school librarians <coughs> and the right to read, and and as uh, I think the mention of ideological and, and uh, cultural issues being uh, dominating the discussion around education and not the fundamental needs that it has and what we can supplement those needs with in terms of resources, uh, you know, and I want to. Uh, uh, congratulate uh, the Department of Education for uh, continuing to protect the students' right to read and the parents' right to choose uh, what they read. And, and not, you know, when you have over 200, 2,500 books banned across libraries in this country or attempts to ban those books, 
And that's a frightening thought. And, and if we're talking about ideological uh, grievance issues, uh, the, you know, one parent's rights are important and need to be protected, but the ability of children to have access to the best information and for that to be empirical and for that to be protected as a right, I think is also important. I want to congratulate your department for protecting that. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Grijalva. Mr. Wahlberg, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And thank you, Ms. Mr. Secretary, for being here. Thank you. Um, during the prolonged school closures caused by the pandemic and the outsized, <laughs> and I say that again, outsized teacher union influence, many parents were able to get a window into their child's education like never before. It's about time. They should have been doing it sooner. Uh, parents knew that school closures were harming their children and they needed to get back in the classroom as quickly as possible. We recently saw a sample of the devastating impact these schools' closures had on our children's education. In the nation's report card, student testing scores have declined in history, civics, reading, and math. Last year, the acting associate commissioner of the National Assessment of Education Progress said, these are some of the largest declines we have ever observed in a single assessment cycle in 50 years, end quote. Mr. Secretary, in February of 2021, the CDC planned to release guidance to reopen schools regardless of community spread of COVID-19. But then the CDC consulted with the American Federation of Teachers uh, and, the, and its president, Randy Weingarten, who provided edits to the <coughs> reopening guidance. These edits, according to CNN's Jake Tapper at the time, would have allowed schools serving 99% of children to potentially close. Mr. Secretary, we know how important in-person schooling is, and we know how devastating remote learning has been. By 2021, we also knew that COVID posed low risk to children. So the question comes, Mr. Secretary, do you think the CDC was wrong to provide AFT President Weingarten veto power over their guidance and do you think teachers' unions were wrong in, discour in discouraging schools from reopening? Thank you, uh, Congressman Wahlberg, for, for the question. I share the strong belief that our students needed to be in schools right away and that we needed to reopen our schools. When I took oath on March 2nd, 2021, 46 percent of the schools in this country were open full time. Within nine months, we were over 98 percent of our schools open full time. So my actions prove that I, too, felt schools should be reopened. And, you, and so you felt that Randy Weingarten should not have had veto power for the CDC? I can speak to the Department of Education and what, we're focused, what we were focused on. Well, we're, expect, we're expecting the Secretary of Education sure. to stand up to the teachers' union when they're wrong. I'll and be they very were the frank ones with that you. seem to have veto power Mr. with this. Mr. Wahlberg, when I was Commissioner of Education in Connecticut and then when I became Secretary of Education for the whole country, we worked with various different stakeholders who were all on board with safely reopening our schools and that's well, what I would we hope, did. I would hope that and just, I guess getting to the, to the punchline here, we would hope that in the future that when we have science that goes on and certainly not, not locking down schools again, that the Department of Education would be the strongest proponent for making schools open and working for the kids. Let's go on. We know that the CDC closely consulted the two teachers' unions, the AFT and the NEA, on school reopening guidance in 2021. This year, on April 25th, the New York Post reported, and I quote, AFT and the National Education Association also asked the White House and the CDC for help shaping its press strategy to show the rank and file they and the Biden administration were on the same page, end quote. Mr. Secretary, yes or no, please. Did your department have any role in advising the NEA or AFT on their public relations strategies? Yes or no? We take our work to communicate with the public very seriously. We don't engage in uh, other groups. Yes or no, that's what I asked. I, I understand you're asking a yes or no question, but I want to be very clear on the values of the department. We take the role of communicating with families directly. And did you have any White role House. in advising the NEA or AFT? We do not have a role. So in you advising. didn't have any. You we had do no. Do not role. have a role in advising the NEA or AFT. Okay, Mr. Secretary, um, in states uh, where teachers unions are the strongest, schools were especially so, slow to open, including Michigan. 
according to AIA's Return to Learn tracker, on June 7, 2021, only 38 percent of California schools were fully in person. Illinois, only 40 percent were in person. New Jersey, 23 percent were fully in person. Despite the well understood knowledge of the COVID, uh, in, in that it posed very low risk to school children and the presence of an available vaccine for teachers. Why do you think schools were so slow to reopen uh, where the teachers' union influence w was and has been the strongest? Thank you for the question. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, for me as a father and as an educator, it was critical that we safely reopen schools as quickly as possible. The Department of Education acted immediately to make sure that we provided guidance to schools which was never done from the onset of the pandemic until that day, to, to the summer when we did. We've been providing guidance on safe school reopening and we're proud of the fact that within months, over 98% of our schools were safely reopened. I see my time has ended. Uh, thank you, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Courtney, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your great service and your testimony this morning. One of the many strengths that I think you've brought to this office is that for the first time in history, uh, you serve as Secretary of Education as a graduate of a career in technical yeah. education high school, Wilcox Tech, uh, where uh, my good friend and colleague, Congresswoman <laughs> Hayes, represents the city uh, of Meriden. Uh, but we really are at a moment right now in our economy where career and technical education schools shine. Uh, we have a 3.4% unemployment rate, 9.6 million job openings uh, in the U.S. economy, and the mission and the curriculum of career and technical education is perfectly positioned to help close the skills gap to fill many of those positions. I had an opportunity to witness that a couple weeks ago at a National Signing Day ceremony at Norwich Tech. High school in my district where uh, half the graduating class of Norwich Tech uh, signed letters of intent with their parents, their teacher, and their new employer uh, sitting right beside me. It was like NFL draft day with a packed auditorium cheering these kids on, signing to, up to be electricians, painters. Uh, half, a large portion of those were, were uh, I think, as you know, um, signing letters of intent to go work at Electric Boat Shipyard, which this year has a hiring target of 5,750 wow. people between Quonset Point, Rhode Island, and Groton, Connecticut, to fill the bill of Congress's uh, increased demand for submarine uh, production. Um, again, you mentioned in your testimony that the, um, one of the workhorses of career and technical education, which is the federal Perkins Grant Program, mm -hmm received a $43 million increase in your budget, uh, bringing it to a total of $1.5 billion, a historic level of federal investment in career and technical uh, education. But as I heard that day in Norwich, they are turning away hundreds of kids who would love to take advantage uh, of the, the benefit of, of career and technical education. And that's where your other initiative, the Career Connected yeah. High School Program, which you mentioned, um, would, again, expand that curriculum out to uh, comprehensive high school, something sure. which you and I discussed during a visit there. Can you talk again about, um, again, th this really, I think, surgical focus in terms of trying to address opportunities in our economy right now that uh, young people could really benefit from? Thank you for that question. And you know, I really feel strongly that this is an issue where we can come together in bipartisan fashion and really transform the opportunities that our students have I think it's critical that we move to evolve our education system to be more responsive to the options that students are going to have when they graduate. Um, and I think it's time as a, as a country that we come together to uh, challenge the four-year college or bust mentality that still exists in many places. I was a technical high school graduate uh, with options. I chose a four-year college. We need to provide more students across this country with options to be uh, to join workforce or to start with the workforce and then go to four-year college, oftentimes paid for by the employer, right? Um, so it's about providing options. I, I, I joke that my personal plumber is doing really well. He happens to be in Aruba today while I'm here testifying. Um, but there are options for, uh, for our students. The Career Connected High School is making sure that the technical uh, career pathways that are available to students that, as you said, will lead to jobs, are not available only to students in technical high schools. We need to make sure that our comprehensive high schools provide access to career and 
college counseling and pathways. I've seen amazing examples in my visits across the country of schools that are preparing students for four-year colleges, but are also preparing students for options that exist upon graduation or upon graduation of a two-year school. Uh, I've seen uh, comprehensive high schools uh, engage in uh, advisory boards with industry partners so that their curriculum could be lined up to what the needs are in the field. Um, we want to promote that. We want to make that the norm, not the exception. Right now, it seems like technical high schools and very niche high schools are doing this. All students across the country deserve this opportunity. And as I said before, I feel like this is something that if we put our heads together in a bipartisan fashion, we can really transform education. Thank you. And again, my remaining seconds, I think it's important to note that the um, McCarthy debt limit bill, which would uh, put an indiscriminate chainsaw into Perkins grants and career connected high schools is exactly what our employers across the country do not want. They want to connect people with the right skills to give them jobs, careers that will support themselves and their family. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Courtney. Mr. Allen, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, our nation's $32 trillion in debt. <clears throat> and of course, we talk about it. it's all about the children. And uh, it's amazing that uh, we're maintaining our standard of living on the backs of future generations. Even worse, the Department of Education is dead set on enacting costly programs like this mass student loan bailout. Student loan cancellation will cost every taxpayer in my district $3,527. Let me say that again. My constituents in the 12th District of Georgia now have to pay the federal government an additional $3,527 to cover the cost of someone else's student loan. Do you believe that canceling student loans will financially help Americans who never went to college? Yes or no? Thank you for the question, Congressman Allen. I believe the targeted debt relief plan will help prevent defaults and get people back on their feet. I also believe that the strategies that we're taking so yet, to make yes, college you, more affordable. Yes, you believe canceling these loans will, uh, will, will help folks who, who actually never went to college? Uh, sir, I believe if we help folks get back into repayment without falling into default, it would help not only them, but their local economy. <clears throat> Do you believe that canceling student loans will reduce the amount that students will borrow now that they have every incentive to think the federal government will pay their loans for them, yes or no? Uh, I believe you're referring to the income-driven repayment plan. The income-driven repayment plan that we're proposing is... I, I know about the plan, sir. Yeah. Just yes, do you believe that you should continue this process? We are expanding options for students to attend college. There are too many students in this country that think college is out of reach for them, and we're fixing that. So. <clears throat> Do you believe that canceling student loans will reduce the amount that colleges charge students? Yes or no? In conjunction with our accountability measures and our efforts to make sure that we're holding colleges accountable for a good return on investment, I believe that uh, we are working on making colleges more affordable. Yes, sir, but studies show that increasing subsidies to colleges and universities causes the cost of college to increase. And in fact, that's true under every federal program. Uh, in my first term in Congress, we passed the Every Student Succeeds Act uh, to replace the no, no Child Left Behind. Uh, we did this to block grant the funds directly to the states and let the states uh, uh, take control of our education. Uh, and we also did this to reduce the size, scope, and the budget of the Department of Education. Uh, President Biden's F FY24 budget calls for an increase of $10.8 billion uh, uh, in Department of Education funding. And this comes after $190 billion of COVID relief funds sent to K-12 through schools to help them reopen and, and respond to the effects of the pandemic. Uh, the department's lack of oversight led to their inability to track how the funds were being spent. Now Congress doesn't know if these funds were effective for the purpose of COVID relief. In short, by providing these funds to the Department of Education, we are effectively throwing money down a dark hole. Why would we appropriate even more tax money to the Department of Education when the department has already shown their inability to manage the $190 billion in COVID relief funds? Sir, I know that the American Rescue Plan dollars were a lifeline to districts in my visits to states. I've had parents, students, educators tell me that 
Those dollars were the reason why students were able to re-engage. And I'm sure in your district as well, many students benefited from yeah, the Sir, American I was talking Rescue about Plan. the uh, accountability of the funds. We have on our website, if you go to ed.gov, an ARP data transparency link so that it's very clear where the dollars are spent. And we engage regularly with each state to make sure that the dollars are going what they were intended. Well, let me Congress. ask you this. Has the department taken any action to change their oversight protocol to ensure funds appropriate to them are being spent in, in, in ways that were intended? We take the uh, fiscal responsibility uh, very seriously, and we are engaging in processes that I'd be happy to have my team share with you very specifically what we're doing and how we're supporting states use the dollars to support students getting back into school, mental health supports, and academic recovery. Well, that's the reason I asked the question is that we would like to uh, explore that oversight. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the Biden administration's F-24 budget request proposes a new $200 million Career Connected High Schools competitive grant program. Uh, I've got 16 seconds. Uh, how are you going to get uh, these funds to rural areas that don't have the expertise to apply for these grants? Thank you for that question. I know time is short. Uh, happy to follow up. We have a rural community of practice. We are engaging proactively with our rural communities. They deserve the attention and access to the grants as well. Okay, please uh, 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 respond to that uh, in, in depth so that we make sure rural America benefits. And with that, I yield thank back you. Chairman Fox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Allen. Mr. Sablon, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Secretary Cardona, welcome once again. Um, Good to see you, sir. Thank you for your service also you. and so many of your great ideas, including the fact that... Simone, could you talk into the mic? <laughs> including the fact that my good colleagues, uh, uh, district 110,100 borrowers would lose access to the PSLF and the student forgiveness. Uh, and... Uh, Secretary, it's, it's really difficult to try and figure out how over 14 years I've tried to work as much as I can to get programs out to my SBO district, the Northern Mariana Island, and now to see the impact of the proposal, the debt reduction proposal, where we all go back to fiscal year 2022 levels. Um, over many programs, which many of my colleagues here will bring up today, but for me, Mr. Secretary, uh, uh, Secretary Cardona, the TRIO program is a long-standing program that provides direct support services for over 800,000 underserved students to promote post-secondary education success. Uh, in their, in the default on America bill, Republicans proposed to significantly slash programs budgets by reverting to fiscal year 22 funding levels. What would this mean for the administration of the TRIO programs, how would students enrolled in TRIO experience this cut? Thank you for that question. Without, without question, the uh, reduction uh, to 22 levels would have a negative impact on all major programming. Uh, in particular, with TRIO programs, there would be a $262 million cut, uh, and it would eliminate services for almost 200,000 students that would otherwise have access to TRIO programs and uh, allow students to access higher education. And, Mr. Secretary, I bring up the TRIO program as an example. I come from a district where many of our population are below the poverty level. We need access to Title I programs, the um, Pell Grants, the, you know, all of those different programs that go out there, including the, the including uh, assistance in feeding our students um, for lunch, at least uh, breakfast right. for those. All of those would be severely cut, and I don't know how we would address this. In my district alone, I'm talking about the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, the impact there that's happening now is, is really significant for the government, let alone now if these cuts were to occur, a proposed cuts were to occur. This would have impacts on the several years ahead of us, bringing some of the investments we've already made at a loss. We can't move them right. forward and we can't maintain them. So, and I know, Mr. Secretary, you brought up a lot of different things in, in some of your, including a letter that you really wrote, but tell me, is there anything more that you think we 
the department, our, our students, our teachers, our administrators can lose, potentially lose. Sure. Thank you for, for that question. Look, I think it's important to contextualize this by framing it, investing in our schools is an investment in our students, right? And I, I likened it to defense. To protect our future and the economic growth of this country, uh, investments in our, school, in our students and in our schools is critical. Uh, cuts would limit services. I mentioned uh, career technical education, I mentioned TRIO. Mental health supports for our students. It's important to remember that we are in the middle of a youth mental health crisis. Cuts would remove uh, 40 new grants and 300 existing programs that are providing support for students in their mental health. Uh, so when we think about these cuts, we have to put faces to these cuts. This would mean, you know, we, the, the data showed one in three high school girls over the last three years has considered suicide. One in three. Cutting mental health supports now to levels lower than we currently have would mean that more high school girls would not have access to that mental health support that they need. So if we don't put faces to this, it's hard to understand the impact that would have on our country. Everyone's district, every student would suffer. IDEA, we have over seven and a half million students with disabilities who would not have the support that they would have had before. I can go on, sir, but I know that my time is up. Yeah, Devastating no, impact. Oh, no, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. Madam Chair, are you back? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sablon. Mr. Owens, you're recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Secretary, for being here. Uh, I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, my dad uh, received his PhD in 1951 in soil science, uh, uh, agronomy. Uh, I received a B.I., my biology and chemistry degree in 75 and uh, in biology. I know you, you graduated in 2001. Um, one of the things that we shared in common, my dad and I, even though there's a 24 year difference, is something called organic chemistry. And organic chemistry is a study of organic, uh, organic compounds, property reactions, and predictability. In other words, it's order. Even though you graduated in a different study altogether, wouldn't you agree that changes in organic chemistry can't change because we wish it to be so? I would want to engage in further conversation. Well, no, this is a very simple question. Yeah. Can we change the properties and reactions of organic chemistry because we believe that we wish it so? Um, yes or no? I mean, it's just based on your, your basic common sense. What do you think? I, I don't have enough information okay, well, I'll about say organic this. chemistry I'll say this to, as a scientist, to answer. As a scientist, I'll say no. You cannot yeah. change organic chemistry. If we did, we would not have a, a pharmaceutical industry alive today, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, <clears throat> there's another law. Law, law of gravity. And I know that the Biden administration believes in executive orders, but let me just ask you this, based on equity, is it possible to change the law of gravity so blacks no longer are impacted by it? I'm the answer is no. I'm not sure, Okay, sir, no, no, let, well, let me just say that my, my point is this. Oh. The law of gravity is one of God's laws. It's not gonna change because we wish it so. Right. It's based on predictability. Now, I was a top athlete in high school. I went to the University of Miami, All-American. Played in the NFL, All-Pro. It was based on the fact, as a man, there's certain things we can predict about me. My chromosomes, DNA, hormones, muscle mass, bone mass. Would you say it would be fair for me, any time during this process, from high school until 30 years old, that I had a chance to box or wrestle with your daughter, competing with your daughter? Thank you, uh, Congressman. I think I understand now the line of questioning that you're getting to. Uh, let me just be very clear here. Well, it's, it's now the question, the qu I, 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 I want to make sure I have just a few, okay. few minutes here. The question is, would that be fair for me with what I just described as a man, because I, I, I decided I want to change myself to being a woman, that I can now compete against your daughter? Yeah, it's my responsibility and my privilege to make okay. sure that all students all right. have access. Let me just say this. Let me, I'm sorry. Please just bear with me. Would you say, as an 18-year-old young man, that if me and some of my homeboys decided we wanted to be women, would it be okay for your daughter, for me to go into your daughter's bathroom to expose myself because I felt I was a woman? Would that be fair to your daughter? Uh, Congressman, I, and by I the way, see I have, by, the, by the way, I have five daughters, so I am very passionate about the questions I ask you right now, and I would think it would be no question in your mind as a father 
what these answers should be. This should not be him and horn about this. This, this tell nothing, your daughter now. There's nothing in our proposed Title IX regulations that uh, determine how bathrooms should be used. Okay, okay, all right, let's, let's move on, let's move on. There's, there's something here I want to share with everybody. Sure. Um, <clears throat> it's called the Cloud of Pivot Strategy. Something put in place back in 1966, and I hope Americans really pay attention to this. Uh, it was uh, two Marxists uh, from Columbia. The goal was very simply to, to, pro to propose a, and by the way, this time when the Democrats owned the House, Senate, and, and administration. Propose a, 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 to create a crisis in the current welfare system that would ultimately bring about its collapse and replace it with a system of guaranteed annual income, which is Marxism. They hope to accomplish this by informing the poor blacks, poor black Americans, of their rights to welfare and assistance, encouraging them to apply for benefits, in effect overloading the already overburdened local and national bureaucracy. Uh, would you agree to use misery as a political strategy is the essence of evil? Uh, Congressman, I'm, I'll be very pleased to share how our budget is going to help I'm our not, students. No, no, I'm, right now I'm just I'm, not, I'm talking about using misery to get an agenda across. Is that evil? Sir, I'll, I'll say this. I'll say. Let me just say this. Uh, it is. By the way, the results of this. Uh, this is uh, 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 winning to the race. Create gener the, created this effort of uh, Cloven Piven created generations of black people for whom working for a living was an, is an abstraction. I came through a community in which we led the country in the growth of middle class, men matriculating from college, men committed to marriage. This is what did us in. Political, progressive policies that hurt our kids. I want to place the record. 23 schools in Baltimore have zero proficiency in math. And I would, I would bet you, if your child was in these schools here, you wouldn't sit around and say it's okay to leave them there. You do ever, whatever you had to do, regardless of your income. You will take two or three, four jobs. Poor people have the same love for their kids as, as elitists. So I want to say that, uh, I want to pass, I want to end it to, end it to the record. Uh, the American people waking up. American people waking up. We're going to get this done. Uh, and I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Owens. Ms. Bonamici, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, thank you for your continued work to support thank students. You. And I agree with you about the value of investing in education. So needless to say, I'm very concerned about the cuts that actually Republicans have already voted for on the floor uh, that will negatively affect student learning and pandemic recovery, harm students' mental health, cut CTE programs, increase teacher stress, make college education less attainable, and actually diminish opportunities to access a high quality education for our students, most marginalized students, including students of color, students with disabilities from low income families, and those who identify as LGBTQI. And, and I want to note, um, particularly for the chairwoman and my um, colleagues and friends on the other side of the aisle, I recently participated in a roundtable conversation with parents across the country, parents of trans students. It was a very meaningful conversation. I encourage you to do the same to, as you said, Mr. Secretary, put faces to these stories, and I implore you to stop picking on trans students. And Mr. Secretary, under your leadership, the Department of Education secured funding for and implemented programs to improve school safety, increase wraparound services, expand that important access to career and technical education, and decrease the cost of college. So Mr. Secretary, I want to ask you about Title IV-A of the Every Student Succeeds Act, which funds well-rounded education, addresses school conditions, including school safety and technology access. So the increased funding for Title IV-A from the appropriations process and also from the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act has tremendous potential uh, for school improvement. So how are states and school districts drawing down that Title IV-A funding and also the funding from the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act? Uh, to complement and supplement efforts to make schools safer and advanced, well-rounded education opportunities yeah. for all students. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And you know, as, edu as an educator, uh, s safety in schools is is always going to be the number one priority, especially now when we're seeing uh, so many cases of mass shootings. Just this morning, I, I learned of another one. We're over 225 uh, in, in this year alone in this country. Um, 135 incidents in our schools. 19 of which resulted in death. Safety is a critical priority. Title IV dollars, uh, BISCA dollars, Bipartisan Safer Community Act dollars are, are really needed for our schools to ensure appropriate access to mental health supports, uh, 
making sure that we have more uh, personnel available to students who are experiencing trauma or have experienced trauma or are struggling uh, to help get them the supports that they need before. Uh, the dollars are intended to provide professional development for educators. Oftentimes, this goes on overlooked. We can talk a lot about providing support for, for schools, but we omit the importance of making sure that our teachers have the professional development that they need. Right. You can't right. be informed in trauma or, or given professional development in trauma in, one, in a one hour after school staff meeting. So the dollars in VSCA, the dollars in Title IV are intended to build the capacity of our professional work staff to thank make sure they have the tools they need. Thank you. It, 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 thank you for mentioning professional development as well. And I want to just follow up with a couple of yes and no questions. Will you commit the department's resources, including those available through BISCA, to working with states and school districts to improve school safety in a manner that incorporates restorative evidence-based practices and avoids the overuse of SROs in schools? We are certainly working with states currently to make sure that they know how to use the BISCA dollars to make sure that more resources are available, proactive resources, okay. which include uh, professional development and restorative practices. I appreciate practices. that. You know, I've been communicating about this issue. Are you willing to follow up with me within eight weeks to discuss the department's progress in distributing this uh, Title IV-A funding? Yes, we will Terrific. definitely Terrific. Thank follow you. Up. So, so, Mr. Secretary, as students continue to recover from mislearning time, it's important for the department to develop best practices to mm -hmm. improve student achievement and to share those practices with educators, school leaders, districts, and state leaders. So how can the federal government and the Institute of Education Services pursue innovative solutions to address the effects of the pandemic on student learning? And what would budget cuts to education research mean? Uh, for the ability of schools to effectively address mislearning. Thank you for that, and absolutely agree with you. Uh, we learn best from each other. That's one thing that I learned as an educator, that oftentimes the best way to get learning to happen is to create conditions where folks are learning from each other on shared problems of practice. So we've created different uh, mechanisms for that. Cutting funds for IES and others would only limit the ability for us to, to engage uh, partners, but also invest in evidence-based strategies that we know are aimed at improving instru uh, instruction, but also ultimately student outcomes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. My remaining couple of seconds, I just want to thank you for your thank emphasis you. as well on multilingual education, which is not only good for you know, a global economy, but it's also good as the brain research shows for exactly. student learning overall. So thank you again, and I yield back thank the you. balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici. Mr. Grothman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming on over to our humble building here. The federal student loan system is built to encourage students to take out as many loans as they can without regard how much they'll be able to repay. Uh, massive amounts of, the massive amount students are borrowing is affecting their ability to have a family, buy a car, or own a home. Only 32% of young college graduates with student loan debt say they're living comfortably. Do you think a student should take out more loans than they will comfortably be able to afford? Thank you uh, for the question. I recognize that our current system is broken, and we have the responsibility to make sure that Okay, people shouldn't take out more loans than they can afford, right? Can you agree on that? I, I, can you agree people shouldn't take out more loans than they can afford? Well, it all depends, sir. If Where's you're an 18-year-old, you might have to take loans that you can't afford as an 18-year-old, but eventually when you have uh, a good job, oh. you can pay for those loans. We're okay. improving our we'll, gainful we'll, we'll give you another question. Are you aware that the Higher Ed Act limits financial aid advisors from using their expertise in counseling borrowers to borrow less in cases where it's obvious the student is taking out up too much debt? In other words, if I'm going to a, a university and their counselor is there and their counselor thinks, hey, you can make do with $4,000 this year instead of $8,000, that counselor can't say you'd be better off taking out only 4000 in debt. Are you aware of that? We are making sure that we're communicating with our universities around practices that we feel will help yeah, yeah, students. Yeah, but be they, they can't do that. You know that's against the law right now. Maybe you don't know that. Yeah, I'd be happy to look into any concerns that you have about uh, bad acting okay. or bad actors in, in the field. Well, it's not bad actors. Uh, okay, I've got a bill right now, and I want to see whether you will support it. Okay, uh, we have these financial aid counselors in the universities. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if somebody comes in and says, I want to take out the maximum amount, I'm going to take out $10,000 in loans this year, it is right now against the law 
in many cases for the counselor to say, I think that's foolish, don't take out $10,000, I think you can swing it on $4,000. Do you think the local aid counselor should have that ability? I believe counselors should be able to give students accurate information around what they can. And accurate information includes the ability to say, I don't think you should be taking out such a big loan. Right. I believe counselors should be able to good. advise Good. You're going to be able to help me on this bill. That's what I want. Okay. That's good. Um, next. Um, under your new proposed income-driven repayment plan, borrowers will, only, borrowers will only pay back 63 cents of every dollar they borrow. Moreover, according to an analysis by the Urban Institute, just 22% of undergraduate students will fully repay their loans. How can you call this a repayment plan when barely almost 80% of the undergrad undergraduates will not pay the loans they took out? The income-driven repayment uh, plan, and I'm really excited about this, is going to open access to college for so many more students. And the goal is to make sure that they can pay, that, pay their debt uh, based on their income. As their income increases, their debt uh, payment increases. Okay. I've seen too many students, sir, as a former educator who've ruled out college, in intelligent students, students who have tremendous potential, rule out college because of the fear of the cost. I'm proud that we're creating a pathway now for all students to feel comfortable and, and make sure that college costs are not okay. the reason why they don't pursue higher education. Imagine okay. the talent in this country that's going untapped. Sir. Well, first of all, I, I'm just going to object for a second there. You are implying that if you don't go to college, your ability is untapped. I think that's a little bit snobby, in my opinion. I know so many wildly successful businessmen who don't go to college, who got a skill, they're in construction, they're in trucking, and to say that your potential is untapped because you didn't go to college, I think you're, I think you're a little bit of snobbery there that I find offensive. But be that as it may, um, I want to talk a little bit about diversity because we hear a little, a lot about diversity. I know a, a university professor in English. She's been involved in like seven different schools, over a hundred different uh, professors of English she's dealt with. None of them would he classify as politically conservative. There was a study by Harvard stu student newspaper study that said only 6.4 percent of the people who responded were conservative leaning after attending a private Ivy League institution. My, my friend's experience, does it concern you when you have that little diversity in ideology in major universities? Does that bother you? Some of my most influential and best teachers never attended college. Okay, well good, I'm, I'm glad you got that right. We'll, 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 we'll stop running down people who don't go to college. Because I find they, are, they sometimes contribute a lot more to society than the people who did go to college. So that's good, but, but the question I have for you does the lack of diversity in thought of the, uh, both of the professors and the college graduates, does that bother you? I am concerned also at some of the attacks on DEI, if that's what you're referencing, sir. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Grothman. Mr. Ticano, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, as someone who remembered my mother, me, yesterday, uh, she never got a college degree and she succeeded very well, but she had the good sense to tell me, you're going to college. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, I share some of my colleagues on the other side's concern about the cost of higher education, the, po the cost of post-secondary education, and that we, and part of the brokenness of the system is, uh, you know, more and more of the cost of going to school at the, uh, higher ed is being borne by families. We've seen states subsidize a public higher ed uh, much less than it did uh, several decades ago. And I also think that there are bad actors out there. Um, I, I want to ask you about the Higher Education Act and the incentive compensation ban that was instituted uh, several decades ago. What do you believe the, the congressional intent was behind this incentive compensation ban? I believe it was intended to uh, limit um, the ability for compensation uh, for services that were provided uh, to students uh, by third-party servicers. Well, it, it, would you agree that the incentive compensation ban was intended to prevent colleges from behaving in unscrupulous ways 
Um, uh, and do you, do you know of some of the thing, some of the behaviors that Congress noticed uh, in its hearings several decades ago about the behaviors that they were seeking to be, uh, seeking to curb? I'm having a hard time hearing you. Can you repeat the question, okay. please? I'm sorry. Can you uh, do you know some of the behaviors uh, that Congress was attempting to curb with the incentive compensation ban? I believe uh, some of the behaviors that were intended to be curbed were some of the behaviors of uh, third-party servicers uh, profiting or targeting students for programming that is uh, less quality. Well, um, that might have been. I mean, are, well, are you are you are you familiar with online program managers? Um, it's something that's emerged in the last ten years. I am. Um, they're known as OPMs. Are you aware that? what many critics are saying about online program managers. Uh, these critics are alleging that these program managers are getting around the intent of the incentive compensation ban. I am aware of them. Uh, I believe that higher education institutions must uh, be given the opportunity to uh, evolve and meet the students where they are. There is an increased demand for uh, flexibility in higher education. I think our higher education institutions are right to want to evolve to make sure they're meeting students where they are. With that said, we are in the process of ensuring greater oversight to make sure that they're being managed well so that it doesn't result in what we've experienced with borrower defense and having uh, upwards of $14 billion in loans discharged because students were taken advantage of by certain uh, uh, online uh, predatory practices. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you. Um, are you concerned at all about how the 2011 bundled services guidance by the Obama administration may have opened the door for abuses um, and opportunism by these online program managers? I'm aware that uh, there have been concerns expressed uh, and that there have been concerns expressed by my colleagues on the Hill about the potential uh, negative impact on students, yes. Well, Thank you for that. Uh, critics are charging that students are being sold online programs that are deceptively marketed as equivalents of in-person programs on campus, typically financed with debt. Now, are you concerned that online program managers may be inducing colleges to set up these online programs as cash cows that mislead and target underserved students by aggressively extracting revenue and misrepresenting the value of these programs? We are currently in the process of rulemaking to, to make sure we um, put in the checks and balances that are needed while also giving colleges the opportunity to explore uh, partnerships that uh, recruit students differently and meet students' uh, online needs the way students have asked for. Well, I, I, you know that uh, representatives DeLauro, Jayapal, and Mr. Bowman, and myself in March as public comment on the incentive compensation ban, we recently uh, co-led a letter. Um, borrowers in a social work program offered through the tuition sharing agreement between the University of California and 2U, duly acting as a public company and an online program manager, were left with a median debt of $112,000, but the median salary for uh, their degree was $52,000 two years after their completion. I, I see my time is running now. I just wanted to make sure I got that information. And that's the sort of behavior we're concerned with and how this might be driving students to us unsustainable debt. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. DeCona. Mr. Banks, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Secretary, in April 2021, your department proposed a rule incentivizing public schools to incorporate critical race theory in U.S. history and civics classes. The rule cited Ibram X. Kendi's work and the 1619 Project as examples of the sort of ideas that the department would promote. However, just three months later, you backtracked on the plan and released a watered down, updated guidance that didn't mention Ibram X. Kendi or the 1619 Project. Mr. Secretary, why did the department remove references to Ibram X. Kendi and the 1619 Project in its updated guidance? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, we take uh, the role of supporting our districts and schools very seriously, and we know that decisions around curricular uh, materials are best left to local districts, and we'll continue to have that belief as we move forward. So you, you, it, 
it, the guidance was there to telling teachers and schools, go teach about Ibram X. Kendi and 1619 Project. You took it out. Did you take it out because you decided ultimately that what they're teaching is inappropriate to teach our kids? Well, as I said, uh, Congressman Banks, we take the role very seriously of what we have, and the federal government doesn't have a role in curriculum, but what we recognize and what you mentioned illustrates I'm, I'm asking whether or not it's appropriate. Mr. Kendi called Justice Amy Coney Barrett a white colonizer because she adopted two Haitian children. Do you think that's appropriate to teach our kids? What I was going to say earlier, sir, is... Mr. We Kendi also, in his book, he stated that capitalism is essentially racist. So at one point, you wanted to teach our kids Ibram X. Kendi's uh, findings and his teachings that capitalism is racist. Do you believe capitalism is essentially racist? What I was going to say, sir, is that this issue of, uh, you know, even the grant proposals that we put out, where while we don't uh, influence curriculum, has become uh, the target of, of divisive culture wars. And we choose to stay above that and really focus on supporting our districts. I don't know and if it's a, Ibram X. Kendi argued that white people created the AIDS virus. Is that divisive? Sir, I would ask you to save the questions for perhaps that author. What I would say is we're Sir, focused. You, it, it was in your um, original uh, uh, rules proposal. You wanted to teach our kids Ibram X, what Ibram X. Kendi and the 1619 Project said. 1619 Project teaches that Abraham Lincoln is a white supremacist. Is Abraham Lincoln a white supremacist? Sir, again, you could choose to use your time to be divisive. I want to work together. Uh, Mr. Because Secretary, and students you, have asked in, me, a, in a, a rules proposal, you wanted to teach this garbage to our kids. You eventually backtracked on it. I, I was just hoping you would tell us you backtracked on it because ultimately you've, you came to the conclusion that it's inappropriate to teach our kids critical race theory or some of the garbage that 1619 Project and Ibram X. Kendi uh, teach, but apparently you don't want to tell us that today. While you could choose to be divisive with your time, sir, I want to talk about what we're trying to do for the American people and what we could do together if we focus our efforts on what students uh, and Mr. parents Mr. Secretary, need. how about this? Two weeks ago, uh, U.S. students' civics and history scores were released, and they were the worst ever in American history. And I, I think one of the reasons why is because your administration, in a divisive way, wants to teach this kind of garbage to our kids. But let me move on. Um, Indiana, my home state, recently passed a law at the state legislature that banned biological males from competing against girls in high school and elementary sports because, obviously, biological males have some physical traits that would give them an advantage in sports over girls. The Education Department, your department, uh, proposed a rule change that would pull federal funding from schools that don't allow biological males to compete against girls, girls uh, in sports. Mr. Secretary, yes or no, do, does that mean that, you're, that your department would take away school lunch programs for needy kids because a state or a school won't allow a boy to compete against a girl in the sports? So uh, going back to the civics, if I could, no, no, I, I'm are, asking you a question. Are you, are, do you support taking away school lunches from kids who go to schools where boys aren't allowed to play on girls' sports teams? We are promoting a, the most rigorous, intensive academic programming under the Raise the Bar. I would love to share more do information. Do you support taking away a school lunch from a needy kid, a kid who might, it might be the only warm meal they get every single day, because that school won't allow a boy to compete on a girls' sports team? I'm proud of the work we're doing. It's a yes or no question, Mr. Secretary. I'm proud of the work we're doing to make sure that all students Madam feel Chair, safe the in answer, school. The answer is yes. This administration would take away school lunches from kids who need that lunch, maybe the only warm meal that might, they might ever get because of the radical agenda of, of this administration. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Banks. Ms. Adams, you're uh, Thank you, recognized uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to enter into the record um, three letters, uh, one from UNCF, uh, one from the American Council of Education, uh, the other from uh, Spelman College um, uh, that speak to some of the issues uh, that they're concerned about uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the services uh, that they want to continue. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it's good to see you again. Uh, thank you for coming to speak with us today uh, about the department's uh, budget. Um, and uh, I'd invite you to come back to my district again. 
uh, sometime soon. It was a pleasure having you there uh, to visit uh, our historic JCSU and uh, Paw uh, Creek uh, Elementary. Uh, last year, we were proud to secure significant wins for minority serving institutions and historically black colleges and universities in the federal omnibus. Uh, and um, uh, several millions were, were allocated. It's a program that was originally uh, included in the IGNITE HBCU Excellence Act. And so I just want to um, ask you to just uh, make a comment or two about the importance of investing uh, in R&D infrastructure programs um, at our schools. Thank you for that. And uh, without question, investing in research and development uh, at these institutions is critical for their continued growth, for their ability to have access to grants and contracts, um, and also to make up for uh, historic um, underinvestment. Um, and uh, we've, seen, uh, we've seen our uh, HBCUs um, welcome and take advantage of those dollars. We see that they have a plan to engage in better facilities to make sure that their students have the same access to labs uh, that other institutions have, which would then make them more eligible for, as I said before, contracts. So we're pleased to be able to provide support for that, and we recognize the importance of doing that to level the playing field. Thank you. And you know, uh, when we look at the, uh, even though the IGNITE didn't pass as IGNITE, uh, there was 50 million going to um, HBCUs, that, and we, we would certainly continue to hope that there would be no competition against the HBCUs and MSIs and that HBCUs could stand uh, on their own um, and not compete with well-resourced institutions like the University of Texas or the University of California. Uh, I'm curious about whether you have uh, vetted your thinking uh, with the experts of UNCF uh, regarding this matter. Yes, we're in regular conversation with our colleagues, um, UNCF and others around the important uh, needs and the unique needs of HBCUs, and we'll continue to work with them and our HBCUs to make sure that their needs are listened to and that we're acting in a way that supports their individual needs. Right. Thank you. Let me. Let me. You were talking about the OPMs, and my colleague was. Uh, just uh, talking about them. I just wanted to uh, mention that the online program managers uh, have seen an explosion in, in the number of contracts with school districts and institutions of higher education uh, uh, as a result of the pandemic uh, necessitating a move to digital and remote learning. Uh, UNCF and many HBCUs have expressed the importance of retaining the bundle services um, uh, exception and of course, letters have been sent to you. These are the ones that we have just uh, put into the record. Uh, so I hope that you would certainly consider, uh, continue to consider those requests. Uh, let me ask you about um, the, the Department of Education on February 15 released two announcements. The first focused on incentive compensation guidance. The second uh, sig uh, sought to significantly expand the definition and the reach of third party service or oversight. Uh, and of course, again, these organizations that I've mentioned have uh, continued to, to express concern about it. Uh, they've described the importance of the current contracting flexibilities with third party higher education providers, and they've expressed support uh, in preserving the 2011, gui uh, 2011 guidance. And so, uh, has the department conducted an analysis uh, of the impact uh, or any changes to this guidance and what that those changes might have on minorities and underserving populations. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, we recognize that there are many different perspectives on this and we want to make sure we're very thoughtful in considering the different perspectives, the different scenarios. As I said earlier, while I recognize that uh, in many cases uh, students are welcoming online opportunities, we also have to make sure that the oversight is, is there so that students are getting a good bang for their buck um, and a good uh, return on investment for their education. So we're in that process and we welcome <laughs> feedback and, and comments from different perspectives and we'll definitely take them into account. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you for your great work. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adams. Mr. Good, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Mr. Secretary, one year ago before this committee, I asked you for an update on the implementation of AG Garland's October 20 
2021 memo to the FBI asking them to investigate parents uh, who are expressing concern about the education of their children in government schools, which their tax dollars are funding, as you know. And this is the same DOJ that arrests and jails peaceful pro-life protesters, that targets Catholic churches in Richmond, Virginia, near my district. You stated a year ago when I asked you about it that your staff may have received information on implementation of the memo, but you had not personally received that. It's now been a year. Have you since uh, received an update on the implementation of A.G. Garland's memo directing the FBI to investigate parents? Um, thank you for the question. Are you asking me if I've received an update from... Yes. Have you received an update on that memo on what's the status of the FBI targeting or investigating parents who express their concerns at school board meetings? Have I received an update from my staff or from the DOJ? Have you re what kind of an update have you received? What's the there, status? What's your understanding yeah. of the status of the FBI efforts to investigate parents who show up at school board meetings? There is no update of anything uh, regarding that. There is no involvement in the NSBA letter from the Department of Education. And as a matter of fact, we strongly support uh, engaging with families and parents, especially at the board level. You know, the subject of that memo in October of 21 was partnership among federal, state, and local tribal and territorial law enforcement to address threats against school administrators, board members, teachers, and staff. It <clears throat> begins with, in recent months, there's been a disturbing spike in harassment, intimidation, and threats of violent against, violence against school board administrators, board members, teachers, and staff who participate in the vital work of running our nation's public schools. Was that true? Sir, I, you're referencing a letter of two years ago. What, was that true? Can you repeat Are that? Are you aware of this big upswing in violence and intimidation and threats directed at school board members, teachers, and staff? Is that, was that true? I'm focusing now, sir, on making sure no, schools you, you are getting... You can't verify that or confirm that being the Secretary of Education that that's true. Right now, sir, in 2023, our focus is in making sure that our school boards have enough dollars to provide the funding so do you support, to their schools. Do you support A.G. Garland's directive uh, targeting parents who show up and express their concerns at school board meetings? Yeah. Sir, if you have questions for the Department of Justice, I would ask you to... You are the Secretary of Education. To, do you support his memo targeting parents who show up at school board meetings to express their concern to I, their I am, school board staff? I have complete confidence that uh, our uh, Department of Justice is well... So you don't to, support it, apparently. You're not saying you support that. I, I believe that they're well within the right to do what they feel is necessary. My focus is on... So you think on, we should uh, t turn over parents to law enforcement if they show up to school board meetings to express concern I, about what's happening in their kids' schools? Thank you. Let me tell you what I feel. I feel parents are critical partners in the process of educating their children. Do you think parents children. have primary responsibility for the education of their kids? Absolutely. Primary authority for the education of their kids? Absolutely. Okay, so if, when a parent shows up to a school board meeting to express concerns, do you think that the DOJ and the FBI ought to respond by targeting those parents? Sir, I believe parents' engagement in board meetings, in school functions, okay, are critically Okay, so you're not important. saying yes, I presume that you don't support that. Now, you, as Secretary of Education, have you done anything to help protect the First Amendment rights of parents who show up and express their concerns at school board meetings without threat or fear of threat of retaliation from government or law enforcement. Yeah, have we you have done anything to help protect that? Yes. yes what have you have. done to help protect that? We communicate regularly with uh, all stakeholders, including parents, including uh, board uh, officials, around the importance of engaging parents at a higher level than even before the pandemic, because I think parents know better than anyone else what the needs of their child are, and well, their I'm engagement is critical. I'm glad to hear you critical. say that. We certainly agree that parents know best. Uh, this October 4 memo from two and a half years ago or a year and a half ago is just another example of how uh, this uh, DOJ under A.G. Garland has become a politically focused, weaponized justice system. In fact, you see, uh, in my office was recently made aware of a report that staff and associates of Loudoun County Schools, <laughs> gosh, they're in the national news all the time, aren't they? It's a classic textbook example of uh, education gone awry here at the local level. But they have orchestrated a campaign of smear attacks, their school board, against uh, and harassment and intimidation against local parents. Uh, of course, as you probably know, they posted on Facebook. Uh, uh, threats uh, against parents was in a Facebook group saying things like, this is school board, you know, lives need to be ruined beyond repair. I'm so ready to show up with guns, LOL. Do you think it's appropriate for parents, uh, for comments like this to be directed at parents? Parents officials. have the right to communicate and be present at board meetings. I support parents communicating their thoughts and their displeasure. Would, would you support with an investigation board. into this, what's happened in Loudoun County Schools just recently? Would you support an investigation into that? We have the Office for Civil Rights that uh, investigates if complaints are made, and we're happy to follow up on any complaints that would are Would you support alleged. an investigation into this? If an, a complaint toward our Office for Civil Rights was filed, I would. 
Thank you very much. Thank I yield you. back, Ms. Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Good. Ms. Jayapal, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Before I get started with my comments, I just wanted to express my surprise that my Republican colleague from Indiana, Mr. Banks, was so concerned about stripping school lunches. And I wanted to remind this committee and anyone that might be watching that last year, 42 Republicans voted against providing school lunches for kids, and Mr. Banks was one of them. And in fact, uh, across the country, we've seen Republican legislators in state legislatures trying to strip school lunches away from kids. So I'm just surprised at the concern, and I hope that perhaps that means we can have bipartisan, uh, complete bipartisan support. We did have bipartisan support last time, but complete bipartisan support for providing school lunches. Secretary uh, Cardona, thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for being here today. Higher education of all kinds is no longer affordable for many Americans. Nearly 44 million borrowers have $1.6 trillion in federal student debt, and middle-income borrowers owe an average of $43,000. Recognizing this crisis, President Biden's student debt relief plan will cancel up to $20,000 in student debt for over 40 million borrowers from low- and middle-income families. Despite these benefits to working families, my Republican colleagues want to stop this transformative plan. Just last week in this committee, Republicans advanced a disapproval resolution to reverse the payment pause and block relief without advancing any higher ed reforms to reduce costs. And because there's a lot of misinformation from my colleagues across the aisle, I think it's important to correct the record and run through exactly who would benefit from the administration's student debt relief plan. Is it correct that 90% of Republicans, uh, excuse me, 90% of recipients of this plan uh, earning less than $75,000 would benefit. Uh, that is true, and some are Republican. <laughs> some are Republican, yes. I'm going to get to that, actually. <laughs> and what's the income cap on beneficiaries that would, would benefit? Uh, $125,000 would be the cap. So no one earning above $125,000 is going to benefit. And relief isn't just among younger working Americans, right? How would older retired Americans benefit from debt relief? Yes, uh, older uh, Folks who have debt would also benefit from this, so it's not just intended for the younger uh, folks. In fact, older Americans owe a quarter of federal student debt, and 7 million borrowers age 50 and mm -hmm. up either owe or are paying for a loved one. Is that correct? That is correct. We know that one in six Americans living in rural areas, represented by many of my colleagues across the aisle, have fallen into delinquency or default. Tell us about the rural borrowers who would benefit from the debt relief plan. Yeah, I've visited rural communities and spoken to uh, educators and, and folks who are uh, trying to get back on their feet after the pandemic in rural communities. I would argue rural communities were impacted uh, maybe more significantly due to lack of access to broadband and, and other uh, uh, other things. So this would definitely help them get back on their feet as well. It's clear that the administration's plan to cancel student debt would be far-reaching and targeted at those most in need, and I just find it uh, a, a, a stunning hypocrisy that my colleagues across the aisle might want to stop this plan, even as we know of at least 12 Republican members who opposed this relief but received $22 million in total from PPP forgiveness. And Madam Chair, I'd like to enter into the record uh, a list of Republican members of Congress whose PPP loans were forgiven. This is from the Center for American Act Progress Action. And a list of uh, the Ed and Labor 118th members from the Debt Collective um, that shows what they paid for college when they went and what it costs today, as well as includes those members who got PPP loans forgiven by the government. Without objection. Thank you. Now, as we approach the end of the loan payment pause, borrowers are expected to start repayments in the coming months. How would debt cancellation help these borrowers before returning to repayment? It would cancel out debt for uh, many, up to 20 million uh, borrowers would no longer have debt and would be able to get back on their feet. Again, it's, it's important to remember the purpose of this was to prevent defaults um, uh, and make sure that folks are not worse off now than they were before the pandemic. Uh, it would definitely address, uh, as I said before, uh, about 20 million would no longer have uh, a, a payment. And this resolution that Republicans advanced out of committee that would block critical relief and retroactively end the payment pause between September and December of last year, how feasible would it be for servicers to prepare and prevent borrowers who are expecting the pause to end later this year from defaulting? That would uh, increase the likelihood of default significantly. 
The resolution could also limit your department's ability to quickly issue a new pause, as the last administration did twice. How long would it take your department to issue a pause in the future emergency if you had to go through the rulemaking process? It would significantly delay putting many uh, borrowers in default. Uh, and, and it's important to remember that the actions here under the HEROES Act is consistent with what was done in the previous administration. We are using the HEROES authority that I'm given, and, and I use that waiver. Uh, there was no objection in the last administration. There shouldn't be any now. That's right. Thank you so much, Secretary Cardona. I really applaud the work you and your department have done and continue to do for all our students across the country. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Jayapal. Ms. McLean, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Um, I'm, I'm just amazed. I, I talk. I hear my mom talking in my, in the back of my brain. She's on that shoulder. She always said, Lisa, if you make a deal, you got to hold up your end of the bargain. And Lisa, if you have a right to something, you have an obligation as well. Seems like we want to pick up one end of the stick, but not the other. So I want to take a moment and just, since it's Mother's Day, and thank my mom for all the wisdom and guidance that she has given me on rights and responsibilities. And if you pick up one end of the stick, you pick up the other. So thanks, Mom. Um, switching gears a, a, a minute. Uh, in 2021, uh, you had a hearing before this committee. And you said you believed all colleges right, um, should be treated equally. Is that still your position? I do. Awesome. And I want to protect the students and the taxpayers, but give, uh, but, but the idea that the department can act unilaterally to forgive student debt using the borrower defense program to discharge student debt to me is alarming. It's concerning. And I hear my mom in the back of my, uh, back of my head. Mr. Secretary, I'm trying to get some data before I just talk about opinions. Mm -hmm. Do you know or can you tell me how many public universities have had claims approved under the loan discharge program? Are you saying the borrower defense uh, yeah. actions? Yeah, I, I can have my staff reach out to you with specifics about that, but the borrower defense is Wonderful. really protecting students from bad actors that are yeah, absolutely. selling them. Absolutely, yes. and I think there's bad actors in public universities, yeah. private universities. Pro I mean, yeah. you're always going to find bad actors. I wish we were all perfect, but that's not the world we live in. Um, do you have the, or can you get me the data on the amount of number of career colleges that have also uh, um, had claims approved? Sure, we'd be happy to follow up with Okay, when can I expect that? that? Well, uh, we engage in... Uh, feedback and, and communication with uh, the committees regularly, so I'll, we'll make sure we act in good faith to continue that uh, communication to get you the information. So July 1st, do you think we I'll should at least have I'll have my team reach it? out to your team very soon to share when you could expect that. I'm, I'm sorry. You have I will no have idea my, when you're going to be able to get me the data? Well, you know, we have uh, 45 op uh, letters that were sent to us, and we're working in good faith to make sure we communicate But, but it's really simple. I'm just trying to get the data on mm -hmm. how many public universities and private universities have had claims approved under this loan discharge program. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that information could be gathered, and I'll have my team reach out to yours. Is it? I appreciate that. I'm kind of looking for a date. Yeah. That's fine. I'll have my team reach out to yours to share with you a date that you can receive that information. It's important that you have the information. and it's I would agree, too. And with as much money as we give the Department of Education and as much as we care about the students, I would think somebody has this data. Yeah. So can, I mean, you want to say August 1st? Uh, I mean, that's like three months. I would think we could be able to get this data yeah. in a three-month period of time. Yeah, we think it's really important to communicate with you, and I'll have my team reach out to yours to to share a timeline of when we can get that information to you. Am I the only one that thinks that? OK. All right. Well, thank you for your speedy expedience on this. OK. Um, I understand that there's also been a lot of FOIA requests made by private organizations and institutions trying to get information on these claims and have not received them yet. Has your department um, been processing and responding to these requests? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, the Department of Education is committed to being very clear and providing information with oversight. We take that very serious, seriously. We just We're don't take the responsive. timeline free, seriously. We've provided over 2,400 pages of documents in this Congress alone. Uh, we've responded to 
uh, 45 letters this Congress alone, and we're going to continue to take that very seriously. How many employees because oversight do you have in the important. department? How, how many employees do you have in your department, and what's your budget? Roughly um, uh, under 4,000. Under four, okay. Okay. So I'm going to take that as a yes. You have been processing and responding to these FOIA requests? We take that very seriously, and that's, we that's have That's a great been. answer to a question I didn't ask. So can we just stick with the question? Yes or no? I mean, we learned that early in education. Has your department been processing and responding to the FOIA requests? Yes, they have. No, they haven't. I'll even accept an I don't know. Yeah, we take FOIA requests very seriously, and we have been responding. So the yes. We take FOIA requests very seriously, and we have been responding. What color is your suit? I'd be happy to focus on yeah, our budget. Respect for the I'm just trying to figure out if we can answer a question. I'd be okay. happy to. All right, speak Madam to Chair, the I think this well. information is vital not only for the oversight role but also to understand President's request for a 600 percent increase in the budget in the Student Financial Aid Office. I hope that you're willing to work with me to get this data from the department and get it in actually a timely fashion for the American taxpayers. So with that, Madam Chair, I yield thank, back. Thank you, Ms. McLean. I intend to try to pursue this Time a little up. bit myself. Ms. Wild, you're rec recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Secretary, for um, being here. And I have to applaud your patience and decorum throughout this hearing. Um, as we sit here, primaries in my home state of Pennsylvania are taking place. And some of the most important races in Pennsylvania right now and across the country are school board races. Mm -hmm. um, and as I sit here, having already voted by mail, um, I'm hearing reports of people at polling places who are harassing voters with ridiculous claims, many of which are the same that you have heard talked about here, um, including uh, you know, claims of teachers grooming students and um, just so many outrageous claims that really I think do a disservice to public education in general, to the teaching profession. Um, I feel as though your job and the job of our educators has been ma made much harder than it should be. Um, public education is just so important and you know, I really believe that you and the vast majority of our educators are incredibly committed and dedicated to the students and to the parents. I, I sit here as a mother of a 27 and 30 year old, um, but I was involved in their parent teacher organization throughout both of them being in elementary school, as were many other parents, mostly mothers. Um, I was a working mother, made a point of being involved and was never in any way impaired from being involved in my children's education and was able to weigh in on sit through classes, whatever needed to be done. And I would suggest that people's time could be used much more productively if they got involved in their children's schools, which is very much needed. But I'm sorry that this has become such a divisive and hostile issue. Um, and it, it's not surprising that we are losing scores of teachers every single year at a time when we obviously need more. Um, but I'm gonna shift gears um, because we had the pleasure in Pennsylvania 7 of having you visit one of our wonderful two community colleges. We had a great day there, and I am a real fan of community college education. Um, and what I'd like to hear from you um, is just some discussion of the advantages to our society at large, not just to students, but to our society at large, of providing um, affordable or preferably free community college education. Take it away. You know, it, it, it really is just about opportunities. Um, I really feel, and I, I've spoken to mayors, to governors, uh, college presidents that recognize community colleges are really economic drivers for their community. Uh, I remember visiting uh, recently uh, Columbus, Ohio, Com Columbus State Community College, and we were on a, a panel, and the K-12 superintendent was there. The two-year college president was there. I think it was the vice president of Intel was there, because they're investing there. And the coherence between their shared goals and strategy will lead to students that attend those schools to graduate without debt, with six-figure jobs. 
and they're going to be contributing to the economy. I, I think it, it to, to, this is an investment that pays for itself. What we're doing is ensuring that our K-12 schools have a through line to our two-year schools, our industry partners, and our four-year schools. Because as we're talking about some of this Invest in America, these, these many cases, bipartisan plans, they're going to require that we have uh, many jobs. Um, and we need to make sure that we're preparing uh, the next generation's workforce. Uh, and community colleges are the best tool to get that done. I, uh, not surprisingly, I completely agree with you. And I've learned much more about our community colleges since being in Congress. And I, what I hear from our employers throughout Pennsylvania 7 is just how valuable they are to the employers, that they can quickly pivot and create a new training program, um, a new field that is needed by employers as we continue to hopefully really get manufacturing back into this country. Um, I think they're going to be proved to be even more important. Absolutely. And I really want to see those doors open to everybody as much as possible. Thank you for your commitment to community colleges. Um, I have so much more I'd love to discuss with you. But of course, as usual, our time is up. Um, and with that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wild. Um, the Secretary has asked for a short break. So I'm going to say five minutes because I want to get through as much of this hearing as we possibly can before we go to vote. So we'll take a five minute break. Ms. Miller, you're recognized for five minutes. Would you call on me? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Hello. Why does the Biden administration believe our daughters should be forced to compete against biological men in high school sports? Um, I believe we have the responsibility to ensure that all students can engage in all aspects of public school, including athletics, w without fear, uh, without having to be discriminated against. And uh, that's what we're proposing in our propose, uh, Title IX proposals. Uh, what we're saying is you can't have blanket bans. However, uh, we do provide uh, for, in uh, we allow for local input in the process. Um, we've taken question, uh, we've taken comments for the last month. The comment period ended yesterday. And what we, what we feel we're doing is making sure that no students are feeling discriminated against, especially since yeah. there has been a public attack on well, students. Well, there are, are feelings uh, among the girls, among our daughters, that they're being ignored. Title IX, the uh, purpose of Title IX was to give our daughters opportunities, opportunities to win championships mm -hmm. and earn scholarships. and. Uh, by ignoring this and allowing men into our girls' <coughs> athletics, we are canceling those opportunities. And not only that, in some of our girls' sports, like volleyball, uh, they have been injured. Um, if men can compete against our girls, it erases this ability. But anyway, I would like to get on to the bathrooms. Uh, we've got an issue here. Um, could you tell me, does the Biden administration think it's appropriate to allow biological males to shower in the girls' bathroom, to allow schools to have biological men in the girls' showers and locker rooms? Thank you. I'll, I'll be happy to answer that question. I want to make reference to where we agree. Title IX has been excellent in giving more opportunities for girls. High school uh, girl athletes have gone from 150,000 in 1972 when Title IX was passed to over 3 million today. So yeah. you're absolutely right. Uh, with regard But they're very discouraged right now. I've talked to coaches and athletes. The girls are very discouraged when they spend years preparing and they um, are being canceled out by biological males being allowed to participate. But let's get on to the bathrooms, because that is a hot topic sure. right now. And what we want to know yeah. is, does the Biden administration believe it's appropriate for schools to allow biological men in the girls' locker rooms and in their showers? So the athletics uh, proposed rulemaking process uh, is about athletic team eligibility. It has n There's no language in there about bathrooms. Those decisions are made to local are, are made by local boards and well, local sir, states. Well, sir, you're a policy setter. You put out guidance, and we have rules that are coming from you. 
And actually, I brought some with, and I'd like to mm -hmm. enter them, Madam Chairwoman, into the record. Um, your own guidance uh, that talks about bathroom policy, and actually multiple states have had to sue you to keep you from enforcing these policies. And uh, you created this mess, it didn't just happen, but okay, let's go on then. Can you say unequivocally that biological males should never be allowed in girls' locker rooms and showers? As I said before. Just answer yes or no. Should they be allowed or should they not be allowed in there? As I said before, uh, you're, you're asking questions on something that we're not uh, in our proposed rules. I would love to work with you on how we it's can take into consideration. Sir, you all created this mess. It didn't happen out of nowhere. Um, under, the, by, under the Trump administration, Secretary DeVos, she was able to say unequivocally that girls should never have to shower in front of a biological male and they should not be allowed in their locker rooms. And you have created it. It's in your guidance. Multiple states have sued you to keep you from enforcing this. So I would like you to state, yes or no, will you say unequivocally that biological men do not belong in our girls' locker rooms and showers? We absolutely, as a father and as an educator, absolutely support making sure that uh, boys and girls use different uh, showers. That, that's common sense. What I will say, though, is that we have the responsibility also to ensure that all students feel safe and welcome yes. in their schools. Right. We want, we want our girls to feel safe, and because of your guidance, your rules, the Biden administration's policies have been pushing this, creating this mess. We have multiple cases where girls have been assaulted, where they have been traumatized because there have been biological men in their locker rooms and showers. In my state of Illinois and at Waterloo High School, girls were forced to use the nurse's office if they didn't want to share a bathroom with men, and then they were disciplined for not using the same bathroom. You are trying to dodge and conceal your position because you know parents are horrified that the Biden administration wants to force their daughters to compete against biological males in sports and shower with them in the bathrooms. Thank that, you, uh, Ms. Miller. Ms. McBath, you're recognized for uh, five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. And Secret Car Secretary Cardona, thank you so much for visiting with us once again today, and as much as Republicans want to say, otherwise you are not trying to break the system. Uh, your department really is taking real steps to make it truly work for working families and every American who has been completely left behind by a higher education system that continues to be pay for play. And I'm proud to stand by you and President Biden in our fight to make sure that our uh, higher education system is more equitable, and I'm disappointed by efforts in Congress to roll back you know, all the important and just really popular steps that have been taken by your agency. While every single House Republican recently voted to pass a debt limit bill that reduces the maximum Pell Grant by about 15% and cancels the student <coughs> debt relief that working families in the state that I represent, Georgia, are counting on, um, House Democrats and Secretary Cardona, you are trying to do just the opposite. Instead of cutting programs like Pell uh, and attempting to decrease the maximum award for the first time in over 30 years, we are trying to expand upon them. Instead of trying to balance the budget on the backs of those who can't afford to go to college, we are taking real steps to even the odds for the hardworking families across the country. And the Pell Grant covers the lowest percentage of the cost of a college education in the history of the program at just 30% of the estimated cost of a four-year uh, institution's uh, cost. And if it were up to House Republicans, it would count, it would cover even less. It would count for even less than that. A college degree or credentials continue to be the surest path to economic security for Americans. And we must do more as a country to make sure that we're <coughs> ensuring that every student has the resources necessary to follow that path. Now, there are over 122,000 real people in my district in Georgia that qualify for some sort of student debt relief under the pres President's Debt Forgiveness Program. And that's more than just about any other of the members in this room. And I do know that to be a fact because we checked. These people aren't just numbers. 
These are the nurses that take care of us when we can't take care of ourselves, and the teachers that you trust uh, to teach your kids and to keep them safe in school. More than 80,000 people in my district who applied for these funds or who were automatically approved are counting on them to come through. And that's what's, you know, really the harm here. You know, for the last 50 years, students whose families can't afford to pay for college have relied on Pell to be there for them. And it's alarming to see that every Republican on the House, in the House, would go on record supporting cuts to Pell at a time when in this country, you know, already the Pell Grant covers the lowest share of the cost of a college education in the history of the program. Their proposal would eliminate Pell for thousands of students in Georgia and cut the maximum award by nearly $1,000 for the 640,000 plus students in my state who still qualify for Pell. Secretary, please take your time. Please expound once again for us as much as you possibly can. No trick questions for you. Mm -hmm. Can you share more about the economic significance of Pell and the negative impact that these cuts would have on working families? Yeah, thank you for that. You know, Pell helps level the playing field for students so that their participation in higher education is based on their ability, not on their wealth. Uh, it opens the doors to students, many times first generation college students, to not only change their life's trajectory, but also the trajectory of their own children. Uh, and as I said earlier, it allows us to really maximize on the talent that we have in our schools. Many times students feel like they're not going to even consider college. I've had experiences where I talk to parents who, as young as elementary school, said that their children cannot go to college because they cannot afford it and they fear the cost. Pell allows students to have access to higher education, to higher earning potential. We know college graduates make on average a million dollars more over the course of their life. Uh, than students who graduate high school and do not go on to. So we're trying to open up access to higher education, whether that's through Universal Community College, which we know is an economic driver for communities, uh, four-year colleges, which we know provide students pathways to economic stability. Uh, we're trying to open doors. Pell does that, especially because it focuses on students who uh, are most financially in need. Thank, Thank you. you. I yield. Ms. Steele, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox, for hosting this hearing, and thank you, uh, Secretary Cardona, for participating today. For a long time, the CCP has spent millions of dollars, and also our tax money went in back in Confucius Institutes to promote the CCP propaganda and they pressure universities to censure any criticism of the Chinese government. The CCP has been infiltrated in our universities. We must ensure that CCP cannot gain access to sensitive research happening on our campuses. In many cases, research is funded by the federal government. I have legislation to identify and remove hostile actors that are deemed a foreign intelligence threat to higher education and set the reporting gift threshold from Section 117 to $5,000 or lower so that we may be aware of foreign investments in our universities. Mr. Secretary, the department Education Department recently published a notice seeking comment on whether Section 117 institution reporting is necessary to proper functions of the department and whether the information will be processed and used in a timely manner. I un understand that reporting foreign gift, gift uh, donations is not a, partic a popular topic for institutions. But if information on foreign funding is now reported to the department, <clears throat> apart from releasing a new web page that serves as a repository for old guidance and increase for Section 117, how do we cannot the dot, dots to understand how our foreign adversaries 
are asserting their influence on college campuses. How does Biden administration propose to protect our sensitive research from our greatest adversaries? Thank you for the question, uh, Congresswoman Steele. Uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly that this is an area of importance uh, and that we must make sure we protect uh, the intellectual property of the United States and our campuses from foreign threats. Uh, uh, and we take those very seriously. Um, we have improved the system for uh, transparency and accountability under Section 117. And we are working really hard to ensure compliance of reporting, which has been in the books for 20 years, but hasn't really been kept up. Uh, we're proud that um, we have uh, 34,000 filings of uh, public gifts in the last two years, which is we're on track to be the uh, administration with the most filings. Um, and this is all in part uh, to demonstrate our, uh, the importance we place on protecting American uh, interests and reducing potential foreign influence uh, on our college campuses. Seems like CCP's beliefs are stealing is faster and cheaper than they are actually working on their own technology, especially our universities, and they are inside of our universities and try to steal those researches, so it's really important. Um, Mr. Secretary, I'm sure you would agree that it is essential to visit schools in person to learn firsthand how they are doing and what they needs they have. You have also said on many occasions that you support all high quality schools, including public charter schools. It is very important in Orange County and they are very successful, but to my knowledge, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you have never visited a charter school while Secretary of Education, even with half of the students in DC attending charter schools. Will you commit to visiting charter schools before the end of this year, especially after COVID? This is really important to see that these kids are in school and they're learning totally different than regular public schools and it's really, really, amazing that yeah. you know charter schools are doing much better than any other schools. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Steele. I agree, charter schools do provide uh, an option for students and, and parents. Uh, sometimes they focus on specific uh, learning pro programs or s specific sciences. Uh, public charter schools are definitely uh, uh, examples of schools that um, are tailored toward meeting specific needs that parents are seeking. And, and I do commit to uh, visiting a charter school uh, throughout my um, my career as an educator, not only as secretary but previously, I've seen uh, charter schools, uh, public charter schools, serve the public and meet the needs of families. Um, so there's support for them, but also I do commit. Uh, if I have not visited, I visited uh, over hundreds of schools. If I haven't visited one, I do commit to visiting a charter school. Please come visit Orange County Charter Schools; that they are very successful. My time is up, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Congresswoman Steele. Congresswoman Hayes, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, thank you, Secretary right. Cardona for being here today. Of course. And for your seriousness um, at focusing on the issues at hand. But I will say that is a very nice blue suit that you're wearing. Um, I was also happy to hear today in committee that Mr. Banks, like myself, also cares about making sure that children have warm meals when they go to school. It is something that is deeply personal to me and an issue that I am committed to fighting for in this Congress. So looking forward to some bipartisan support on this issue. But I'd like to switch gears today and focus my um, questioning on early childhood education. The Head Start program is one of the greatest anti-poverty initiatives in American history. Six decades after its founding, Head Start has served 38 million children, including me. Head Start participants are 12% less likely to live in poverty as adults and 29% less likely to receive public assistance. Connecticut has 86 Head Start and early Head Start centers serving approximately 5,000 children. Unfortunately, in 2019, about 100,000 children lived in poverty in Connecticut, which, meant, which means that around 95,000 children did not receive access to early math and reading readiness or immunizations, dental, and medical care that Head Start provides. 
Nationally, only 10% of eligible children and their families have access to Head Start programs. In the fiscal 2024 budget, President Biden allocated $500 million for a demonstration program in the Department of Education to create or expand free, high-quality preschool in schools or community-based settings, including programs like Head Start, for children eligible to attend Title I schools. In the State of the Union, I was especially pleased to hear uh, President Biden make the case for universal pre-K and raises in teachers' pay. He said, and I quote, the way to put America back on top and create the best educated workforce is to make it so preschool for three and four year olds is universal. Dr. Cardona, I know you understand that earlier, the earlier children attend school, the better their academic outcomes are and the quicker parents can return to the workforce. Can you tell us about what policy the, the department is putting forth to improve access to pre-K for kids? Absolutely, thank you for that. And you know, as teachers that we are, we recognize and we saw in our classrooms the <laughs> students who had access to it and the students who didn't. And um, oftentimes, uh, the students who didn't required some level of intervention to catch up. Uh, we, as you mentioned, have in our budget a proposal for uh, close to half a billion dollars to expand um, preschool and early childhood experiences. And we at the department recognize that it's incumbent upon us to work with HHS to make sure that we're connecting the dots and that we're modeling what we want to see in our states. Um, early childhood education is critical, especially when it's connected to the K-12 system so that the experience that pre-kindergarten students have uh, whether that's run through HHS and their, their programs or the programs that are run in the community are connected to the kindergarten program so the students and educators are, are well the educators are communicating so that the students experience is a positive one. Um, we're big on the science of how children learn best. We know the science around how children learn best, play-based activities where they're using oral language. I can continue but I'm sure you have other questions. Uh, it's, not, it's an area of passion of mine. Well, no, but I would like to give you some time to address the outlandish statement that was made on this committee today. Uh, quote, if me and my homeboys decided to become girls and expose ourselves to your daughter, how would you feel about that? End quote. I just want to say it for the record that no Democrat, no functioning adult yeah. wants that. And you, Dr. Cardona, as a public school teacher, a public school administrator, as the parent of public school children, can you tell us what policies the department is putting forth to support all students who uh, attend our schools? Right, well, you know, some of those comments, I think, uh, are doing exactly what I warned us. We should be focusing on what the American people are asking us for. They're not asking for divis uh, divisive comments. They're asking us to work together. Uh, student safety is, a primary, uh, is of primary importance. Making sure that students are accepted in schools and, and um, acknowledged for who they are uh, is critically important. In this country, we're seeing a lot of attacks on specific students, especially students who have already uh, experienced the most, most need for mental health support. Uh, so we need to stand up for all students and make sure that all students have a place in our schools. Thank you, Dr. Cardona, and I appreciate you bringing forth data that talked about the rates of student suicide mm -hmm. because I've been one of those teachers on the receiving end of just heartbreaking stories when students are breaking down and saying that they just don't know what to do next. And many teachers around this country, is, country are the ones who pull those right. students back. So again, thank you for your time. Um, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bean, you're recognized for five minutes. A very good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, uh, E&W Committee, and uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome. We're glad to have you here. Thank you. Uh, you said a couple things that I am with you on. One is we need to raise the bar in education, and two, you said that uh, parents know their kids best. A couple weeks ago, at the very same table that you are sitting there now, we heard from education experts and actual students that said the biggest thing that we can do to raise the bar and empower parents and kids is give school choice, give choice to parents to determine what's best for their, their kids. And we heard some sort of dramatic minority students who have overcome just significant obstacles in, in life. And then there's the Opportunity Scholarship right here, program right here in D.C. that's just turned it in some great numbers. 
of, uh, of kids in that program graduate from high school. 90% go on to college. It's 94% are, his, are, are minority, and the, uh, the audience is uh, about $25,000 a year. What are we doing to promote choice? Yeah, thank you, uh, Congressman Bean. You know, I, as a parent, do feel that it, I should have uh, decisions to make about my child's education. I am a uh, student, when I was in high school, I chose a technical high school, so I had choice. I'm a product of having choice. Uh, so I'm in favor of that, and I certainly feel that parents should be able to make decisions about. Does your budget education. reflect choice? Are we given and encouraging choice of charter schools and so public, and private schools? Yeah, we have we haven't reduced funding for uh, public charter schools, and we recognize that those are parents' choice. What I'm not in favor of, sir, is uh, using dollars that are intended to elevate or raise the bar, as we call it, public school uh, uh, programming so that the funding goes to uh, private school vouchers. Because what ends up happening is we're already having a teacher shortage. If you start taking dollars away from the local public school, those schools are going to be worse. Which but how long is too long? We've heard mm -hmm. of our civics scores are the worst ever. Yeah. We've heard that uh, learning loss now is permeating the land, except for the free state of Florida, which we're doing really well in because we open schools a lot faster than, than other. I believe your microphone is off, sir. I believe your microphone is off. Okay. I, uh, I think about the, uh, the, the district in Baltimore that has zero students mm -hmm. proficient. How, how long should a student have to wait before help? How long is it okay to be stuck in a, in a failing school? Yeah. I agree with you. The, the sense of urgency that I have as Secretary of Education uh, could be illustrated by some of the stra strategies we've taken to make sure that the dollars are being spent to reopen schools. It's provide. a shame the rich people are already left, but the, the minority students, the, the, the people without means are the ones struggling in those schools, so we need to offer them uh, hope. You said we treated all colleges the same, or you, all colleges the same, but proprietary schools right now are taking it on the chin. You and the administration have made it very difficult for proprietary colleges to continue their mission of of bringing hope, you know, mm -hmm. they're the non-traditional, non-traditional, they're older students, non-traditional college students, but for many times this single parent mom uh, wants to better herself can go there. But right now uh, they are under attack. Mm -hmm. And when I meet with them, they say many of them will be closing soon. Why are you at war with proprietary colleges? Thank you for that question. You know, I don't, I don't believe we're at war. I think what we're trying to do is fix a broken system. 90% of the borrower defense claims were against for-profit institutions that were taking advantage of students. So while I recognize they have an important role, we want to make sure that we're protecting students before we're protecting. But what about the good ones? You're 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 targeting all of them. There are some great colleges out there and that are letting people become yeah. dental hygienists. Right. We need our teeth cleaned, right. and uh, they're providing a valuable service. So how are you discerning between good ones if there is yeah. somebody that's a bad one? Thank you for that, and I agree with you. Uh, and and we're in support of colleges that are proprietary that uh, are doing a, and have good track record. We're going to we're going to close them if we don't change our ways yeah. and ease up on uh, because that net you're casting is is all of them right now. What are we going to cut? What are we get? We're uh, you may not know, but uh, 32 trillion in debt. You you haven't proposed to cut anything. What would you certainly this is a uh, education really is a right. state's responsibility. What would you cut? What can we do without yeah. or trim back. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I, I do, as I said earlier, uh, investing in education to me is investing in our country's uh, economic prosperity. There's nothing you would cut, though? It, what about the unspent COVID funds? We still have, you've, you've actually made it easier to, to, un, to, to, to not spend them and extend out. I'm going to yield back my time, but uh, mm. we have to recognize to that we work that together. Question. I'll uh, go with, the, with you at a school, come to Northeast Florida. I'll walk some charter schools with you, too, Madam Secretary. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bean. Ms. Stevens, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our amazing and esteemed secretary you. for your testimony and your time today and your great leadership of our Department of Education. It's a real del delight to have you uh, in the House of Representatives today as we're reviewing our fiscal year 2024 budget priorities and education being at the top of the list. Many of us on this committee are fully in support of funding IDEA 
and making sure that students of all abilities uh, get the education they deserve. And that is why we know our public schools are so important in that charge because Frankly, most of the time, that is where students who are receiving IEPs go. Yeah. And for the families that, particularly in my district in Oakland County, Michigan, we see a very successful model with special education and not burdening these families with additional costs. And so, Mr. Secretary, you're well aware of the impact on COVID-19 and students. And I, I don't think there's anyone in the cabinet who has more of a bird's eye view on that subject than you. And you may remember that we had a hearing on this subject and particularly examining how uh, the impacts of COVID-19 uh, hit and hurt our students uh, who have learning disabilities. And in Oakland County, we have Dr. Wanda Cook Robinson, who's overseeing our IEPs for 22,000 students, uh, doing a great job at that. But interested to hear how the department is working to ensure that schools are providing students with disabilities the services and supports they need to get them back on track uh, both academically and with regard to the goals outlined in their iep yeah thank you for that and you're absolutely correct students with disabilities have uh, were impacted significantly during the pandemic i would argue probably the group of students that has uh, was impacted the most I remember getting stories from parents uh, and, and students um, hoping that they can get back into the classroom and making sure that uh, they would get the support that they missed out on during the pandemic. I received letters of parents uh, from parents who, who told me that their children regressed because the IEP was not able to be met. And we've been, we've been very specific with regard to guidance for uh, students with disabilities. And we've gone as far as uh, having cases uh, investigated by our Office for Civil Rights to ensure that districts follow up on their legal responsibility. Yeah, We've taken that very seriously. For, th for the first time ever, the Department of Education put out guidance on providing mental health supports for students. Uh, the, I think it was the, the summer of 21, to make sure that uh, they had access to what tools were available with the American Rescue Plan dollars. Yeah. We know that that's critically important for students to be successful. Yeah, that's absolutely remarkable. And certainly we know that fully funding IDEA will stop robbing Peter to pay Paul and help our school districts, districts succeed. And it's a wide range of disabilities, physical and cognitive, that our, that our students in, uh, face. And we certainly appreciate you, uh, including mental health. Uh, we also know that students benefit from having diverse teachers, Mr. Secretary. Uh, just 20% of our nation's teachers identify uh, as people of color compared with half of all K through 12 students. And so legislation like the Retain Act, which I introduced with Congressman Brad Schneider last week would address the nationwide shortages of teachers that disproportionately impact our students coming from lower income households and also students of color. And so how is the department, Mr. Secretary, working to support states and school districts in strengthening and diversifying their educator workforce? And what is the department doing to support state and district efforts to address the teacher shortage in yeah. general that was here before the pandemic hit? Exactly, yeah, thank you for that question. And you know, really quickly on IDEA, uh, in 1975, Congress set out to pay for 40%, made a commitment of 40% of IDEA dollars uh, to pay for special education. We're about to hit 50 years on that puppy. You know, and we're at 12.1% in FY23. So it's important to contextualize that. Uh, so with regard to diversity and, and professional staff, this is something that we take very seriously. We uh, created for the first time the Augusta Hawkins Grant that is intended to provide pathways to, uh, for diverse candidates into the teaching profession to make sure that our teaching profession reflects the diversity of our country as well. Uh, we're focusing on creating apprenticeship programs. When we started as an administration, only two states had apprenticeship programs for teachers. We're up to about 16, which means that student teachers would get paid now. Yes. Um, and, and we need to really change that. The goal is to get 50 states. Pay the student teachers. Pay the student teachers. If you want to have diversity in the teaching ranks, make the pathways easier to get into it. Thank you. And with that, I yield back. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Burleson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for, for joining us today. Uh, we've heard previously um, from experts uh, this year, 
<laughs> about the about their concerns of the impact that foreign entities, especially China, have yeah. on our on our higher ed institutions. Do you share those concerns? I do. I do. I, I take uh, foreign threats very seriously, and I, I think it's really important that we protect the intellectual property of our universities. Um, previously, um, the previous administration, not, not presidential administration, but your department and your agency would release information on, uh, on th and request that information from universities on the foreign donors, mm. their names, uh, their information, uh, their, their, the, the country that, of origin, um, and your administration has, is not making that list, uh, all of this the same information public. Why is that? Um, as I said before, we take foreign threats very seriously. We've improved our process and have provided at least 34,000 filings that were made public. Uh, we're on track to have the most filings made public and then any other administration. And it was the last administration, actually, that changed the process to uh, with not share names. We're following the same process that they left us. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, I want to submit for the record a letter to uh, Secretary Cadornia from Lance Gooden. Um, on a letter dated January 19th of 2023, you received a letter from R Representative Gooden. Um, do, you, do you care to comment about, or, or did you respond to that letter? You know, our team works uh, very closely with uh, members of the Hill. Uh, in good faith, and we're going to continue to have ongoing engagement with them and be responsive to the letter. So in his letter, he, he outlines concerns that he has about your offices, uh, or about the changes in the, your agency to no longer include information on the foreign gifts and contracts that are being sent to our, our schools. <clears throat> Specifically, um, concerns related to the University of Pennsylvania, um, which has a connection to the Penn Biden Center, they received from the year 2021 to 2022, $51 million. Um, that this is outlined in this letter. This is the same location that we know had mismanagement of classified documents. Um, he's, he's requesting an investigation by your department into this. What was your response? Well, as I said before, we're going to continue to be responsive and act in good faith to share information. But I must remind you that it was the last administration that didn't feel it was it warranted an investigation on the, that what you're referring to. So, do you do you have any concerns? Do you believe that an investigation is warranted? We have uh, we take foreign threats very seriously, and we're going to continue to respond to letters. And I'm confident that the process that we have in place is creating greater transparency uh, around this information and making sure that people know uh, okay. that we're holding them accountable for compliance as well. My, my next question has to do with the in a, the school board association letter that was dated uh, 2021 to President Biden. Um, that letter that, um, that was submitted specifically stating that, that that group later then issued an apology for that letter. Um, when it was during that time, when, were you aware before they drafted that letter, were you aware or did you work with the, the school board association? Absolutely not. We had nothing to do with the letter that they wrote. Okay, well, that's surprising because the people from the school board association said that, that, you, that they were writing the letter given direction from the White House as from a request from Secretary Cardona. Yeah, I'll repeat, we had nothing to do with that letter and um, we stand by that. Okay, so according to, uh, so the, the NSBA apologized, and this, if I didn't go into this, this is the letter where they claimed that parents, uh, they associated parents who yeah. testified at school board meetings as terrorists, they, they since apologized has your administration uh, apologized because after they issued the letter, um, your administration's initial response was supportive of the letter? Uh, I don't believe that to be accurate. Number one, I think our position has been the same from day one. Parents belong in the educational process and we need to do more to engage parents. Okay, so you, you deny or you, you refute or you, you don't agree with, with the content of the letter in, in regard to parents being terrorists? Absolutely not. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Leisure Fernandez. You're recognized for five minutes.
Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you so much, you. Secretary Cardona, for being here and bringing your perspective that is so unique of having taught in the classroom and taught in the kind of classrooms that we are talking about now. Sadly, um, yesterday, an 18-year-old used an assault rifle to kill three elders and wound two officers in Farmington, New Mexico. Every school in the city locked down, including a elementary school that was right near the shootings. Thankfully, none of the victims were children. However, as you know, in the last 10 years, there have been 664 shootings at K through 12 schools. 267 people have died. So many more have been traumatized. I believe it is heartbreaking and irresponsible that the majority of Republicans refuse to take action on an assault weapons ban. Secretary Cardona, do you agree that banning assault weapons would decrease the number and severity of school shootings in America? I do. So I also believe, thank you very much, and thank you for standing with our children. It is ridiculous that children have to be afraid of going to school, that their parents have to live in fear every time they drop their children off, and that what happened to in Farmington, that you are no longer safe just driving down the street of your neighborhood. But moving on to another matter about financial fitness, uh, I think we need to encourage our young Americans, our students, to give them financial fitness, not literacy, because we all know how to read, but financial fitness, make them strong enough to move about in our world. I have the Financial Fitness Act, which would direct the Department of Education to establish a personal finance education portal available to the public, including both the students and their parents, uh, to provide the kind of information about creating that fitness. Would you commit uh, the bill almost made it through the Senate last, we were that close. But I think you could establish this kind of online port portal now. Would you commit to working with us to do that? Uh, ab absolutely, would. I'd love to hear more about it and uh, uh, hear more about that. I, I think in our Raise the Bar strategy, we're really thinking about ways to improve uh, uh, programming in our schools and make sure the uh, personal Fitness or literacy, uh, financial <laughs> literacy is, is something that students are. But is it okay if I can share a little bit about the previous question? Please do. You know, I was a school principal. I think sometimes we lose sight of the emotion that happens when you're in a school, even if it's a school that's not impacted directly by the shooting. I was a school principal when the Sandy Hook massacre happened. Mm -hmm. I was about 40 minutes away. And I remember the impact that that had not only on myself, the students, the parents, the teachers, um, we should not have to worry about safety of six and seven year olds uh, when they're learning how to read. We've gotten, we've become a bit desensitized as a country. Um, there is no one magic answer to this, but we need to come together around student safety. If we cannot come together around student safety, then I, I struggle. Uh, I struggle to think that we're going to have to continue this fight. Our students deserve to be safe, and as a parent and educator, this is an area that I think we really need to come together on. I do believe that we should come together. I've had some very encouraging uh, conversations with those in the community. Uh, this 18-year-old was supposed to graduate today. He will not. Uh, the law enforcement did a heroic job of responding um, and minimizing uh, the damage. Um, so it is, it, is, it is extremely heartbreaking. Um, but going back to things that are less heartbreaking, but more about promise and opportunity, because that's our job, is to create possibility for our students to remove obstacles. We don't have disadvantaged students. We have students who have aspirations, and we need to help them get there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so I, I am introducing the America's College Promise Act, which would provide tuition-free college for students at community colleges, and especially support low-income students who transfer to TCUs, HBCUs, MSIs, um, you know, Hispanic-serving institutions. That's what we have uh, in New Mexico. Almost every single one of our higher education entities is uh, minority-serving institutions. Um, could you please discuss the need for two years of free community college, what that would mean yeah. to students and, and their families. Sure, you know, and <clears throat> I recognize the time is creeping up here, but it's economic mobility for the, child, for the student, for their families, for their community, for their state. Um, you know, education uh, and, and getting the skills that they need to, to have higher, higher paying jobs and contribute to the economy is something that we should all want. 
to me, uh, you know, universal community college is an investment in our local economy and in our nation's economy. Thank you very much, Secretary. And I do share everyone's concern about McCarthy's default in America Act and the devastating cuts it would mean to education funding. But I've run out of time, so I yield back, Madam Chairman. Chairwoman. Thank you very much. Mr. Kiley, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, Secretary Cardona, you supported uh, student vaccine mandates for COVID. Uh, here's an article from Politico, September 23rd, 2021. Uh, Education Secretary backs mandatory school COVID-19 vaccines. You're quoted in that article saying, not only do we support it, but I'm encouraging states to come up with a plan to make sure it happens. You also said governors should work with their school officials and with their health officials to roll out requirements. Now, you made these statements in your capacity as Secretary of Education. Is it fair to say that this was the policy of the Biden administration, was to uh, was student vaccine mandates? Yeah, at the time uh, of the article that you're referencing, uh, we, were, we had the majority of our schools closed uh, for full-time instruction. Uh, our students were suffering, and it was the recommendation of our health experts. So yes, this was the policy of the Biden administration was to favor student vaccine mandates. It was a recommendation of our health officials, not only at the federal level, but at the state and local level also to, uh, in local districts to, to have students uh, vaccinated. So I'll take so that as a yes. It was administration return. policy to favor student vaccine mandates since you have not denied There was uh, not a uh, federal mandate on student vaccines. Correct, but you encouraged states to adopt them. I encouraged, uh, reopening schools and you encourage there were some states to adopt student vaccine mandates yes or no can you repeat the question did you encourage states to adopt student vaccine mandates yes i did or no? not encourage states to adopt uh student vaccine mandates where states excuse me sir you said right here not only do i support it but i'm encouraging states to come up with a plan to make sure it happens the title of the article is education secretary backs mandatory school covid 19 mandates sir you could read the article or you could talk to the person that was in that position then uh, I supported schools reopening, and in local districts where they were having ma vaccine mandates, I supported uh, the decision made by the local. So I guess Politico officials. misquoted you. Is there any, uh, do you believe, did any states adopt that position, by the way? Did any states adopt student vaccine mandates and implement them? To my knowledge, no states adopted So it that. seems like kind of a fringe position that you offered, if not a single state agreed with it. Another fringe position that you adopted was favoring uh, mask mandates for young children and making their masks throughout the school day. Uh, this was outside the international norm. Most uh, countries in Europe did not do that, yet you insisted that this was backed by science. Uh, Mr. Secretary, did you ever fabricate or mischaracterize scientific evidence in order to support student mask mandates? Absolutely not. What I did was lead the country to go from 46% school reopened to 98%. We'll get to that in a moment. Here's an article from the National Review. A researcher corrects Secretary of Education after he cites her study to justify school mass mandates. If you want to go to the primary source, here's a tweet from you. It's, this is from September 27, 2021. It says, a Wisconsin study found that schools that required masking had a 37% lower incidence of COVID-19. There is a comment from Dr. Tracy Hogue who says, Secretary Cardona, I was the senior author of this study. Our study is not able to give any information about the role masks played in the observed low in school transmission rates. So I'll ask you again, Mr. Secretary, did you ever fabricate or mischaracterize scientific evidence in order to justify student mask mandates? No, what I supported were uh, common sense mitigation strategies that protected students, our educators and families as we reopened school in the height of a pandemic and we were able to successfully well, do that. Well, what you also did was call out governors uh, who did not want to have mass mandates. This is from the Washington Post. Education Secretary Cardona criticizes the Republican governors for banning mass mandates. Why did you feel like it was necessary to criticize these governors for their decisions? I felt it was important to communicate the importance of superintendents and health officials making the decisions, not uh, state governors uh, preventing health experts from having their voice heard. So let's, go, let's then move on to the topic of school reopenings. The states that you decided to criticize, uh, this is a chart of in-person instruction index for the 2021 school year from Burbio. The states you chose to criticize, Florida is near the best, nearly 100%. Texas is in eighth place. The bottom five states were Hawaii, Washington, Maryland, Oregon, and California. Did you ever criticize the governors of those states for refusing to open schools? Can you tell me what that chart is, Adam? I'm it's not from sure Burbio. Uh, it's been widely cited in the media. For what does the top say, though? The font is very small. Average in-person instruction index. How much were schools open? Okay. And what is your question? Did you ever criticize the governors at the right end of these charts for not opening schools? What are the right 
Uh, California, Oregon, Maryland, Washington, Hawaii. I provided guidance regardless of whether the governors were Republican or Democrat on reopening schools. Yes, but you specifically criticized the governors of Florida and Texas for not wanting to force masks on young children. Did you in the same way criticize the governor of California for not opening schools? I was very critical of uh, governors firing superintendents whose job was to protect students and families. Did you criticize Governor Newsom for not opening schools? Again, I was very critical of governors who were overstepping and uh, removing I, I did not hear yes. Educators. I'm sorry. I, we've been listening to you evade uh, yes or no answers all day. The reality is I would encourage you to sort of look at what happened in our state of California. Parents were absolutely beside themselves as schools were functioning just fine in other states, yet our politicians refused to open them. And you never spoke out on the side of those parents and criticized those politicians. This was the most consequential policy, policy failure in modern US history. And I'm afraid to say it, Mr. Secretary, but you and this administration were complicit. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Kiley. Uh, Ms. Manning, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Right. Secretary, for being with us today, and thank you for your service to our country. Uh, Secretary Cardona, the President's budget includes an additional $578 million to invest in increasing mental health providers to mm -hmm. schools. And we know that youth mental health is currently in crisis. That's why this week I am reintroducing the My Improving Mental Health and Wellness in Schools Act. This is a bipartisan bill that would add mental health education to existing guidelines for local school wellness policies and to increase resources for mental health providers in our schools. How do you plan to allocate funds for increasing providers in schools and what is being done to increase counselor to student ratios in our schools? Yeah. Thank you. That's a, a critically important topic. Uh, the mental health needs of our students is, is great. When I talk to educators, when I talk to parents and students, that is the primary request, that they have enough support to make sure their, their students are well. Um, we are working, as I said earlier, we provided guidance in 2021 around how to access it. We're providing pathways uh, to certifications there. We're working with higher education institutions to make sure that they're meeting the demand. We're strongly encouraging and lifting up models of K-12 institutions working with um, community-based health centers to make sure that uh, it takes like uh, the whole community approach. Uh, we have partnerships that we're supporting with these dollars uh, with schools and hospitals that provide mental health supports. But it's also important for us to take a step back and look at mental health support as a continuum. We're also supporting uh, local boys and girls clubs that are providing after school programming for students to be in a safe place with uh, mentors and giving them the support that they need to be successful in school. So we're going from everything from proactive tier one supports in schools, additional school counselors and school social workers, and external community partners that provide mental health support. Thank you. One of the things that my bill would do by, at, by introducing mental health wellness into schools would be to try to normalize the right. opportunity for students to seek mental health assistance when they are having mental health issues to try to remove the stigma around mental health uh, care. Uh, under the Republicans' proposal to cut fiscal year 24 discretionary spending back to the fiscal year 22 enacted level, would we still have funding available for the mental health programs you've, de you've described? We, uh, we would see a significant decrease in funding uh, for mental health supports if a cut uh, equivalent to 2022 funding levels uh, were implemented. It would result in $50 million in cut for mental health supports alone, uh, 40 new grants would be cut, and the support for 300 existing grants would also be cut. So we would see a, a significant decline in funding for mental health services, even though we know we are having a mental health crisis among uh, school-aged children in our country. I'd like to uh, move to a different topic. The President's budget also includes $178 million for the Department, Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, a 27 percent increase from fiscal year 23. By contrast, the Republicans' budget proposal would slash funds for OCR at a time when OCR is receiving record numbers right. of complaints of civil rights violations in schools and, according to the ADL, anti-Semitic incidents on college campuses increased by 41% from 2019 to 2020. 
from 2021 to 2022. I recently spoke with Assistant Secretary Catherine Lamont about the backlog of civil rights complaints and the need for more staff at OCR to process and investigate these kinds of claims. How will the resources that are at the increase in the budget be used to reduce the backlog of cases, and can you commit that they will be used to investigate all of the Title IV complaints, including anti-Semitic incidents? Thank you for that, absolutely. Uh, the Office for Civil Rights, as you mentioned, has seen an increase in number of investigation requests. Uh, in 2019, they had about 10,000 cases. Uh, last year, they had uh, over 19, thousand cases so they went from 19,000 cases 19,000 complaints last year so the funding would uh, ultimately result in additional staff to investigate these cases uh, we recognize cases uh, dis disability discrimination is on the rise as well as anti-semitism so we would be more responsive and um, look into those cases much quicker and can you assure us that the Biden administration's commitment would include protecting all students including Jewish and pro-israel students yes we would definitely uh, be committed to that thank you my time has expired I yield back thank you uh, mr. Moran you're recognized for five minutes Thank you, Madam Chair. Secretary Cardona, my name is Nathaniel Moran. I'm from uh, Northeast Texas. I uh, wanted to talk with you first about this quote you mentioned to Representative Burleson just a few minutes ago. When I walked in, I heard you say to him, quote, we need to do more to engage parents. Did I hear you correctly when you said that? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you support the language in the recently passed Parents' Bill of Rights that sought to codify this need to do more to engage parents? I believe in parental engagement, I believe that that bill would create a level of oversight where the federal government is dictating lo what local boards can or cannot do. Uh, so I don't think that's necessary. So is it your position that uh, really local boards are the ones that know best for their school district and should make those decisions on the local level to the extent that it's possible? I do believe that, yes. Um, when you were in the classroom, you taught fourth grade at Hanover Elementary School. Is that true? No, I taught fourth grade at Israel Putnam uh, Elementary School. I was a, a school principal at Hanover Elementary School. And did I read correctly that you were one of the youngest or the youngest principal when you were the principal at Hanover? I was back then, yes. So in your time in the classroom in fourth grade, uh, I presume that you really cared deeply about your students. You engaged your students. You got to know each one of them individually. Is that correct? And that is correct. Yeah. And you found out pretty quickly that every one of them has different needs. And aside from parents, you probably knew best how to educate those kids in your fourth grade class. Is that accurate? Yeah, it is accurate. And then when you became a, a principal at Hanover, I presume that's about the same truth for your school. You knew your school better than anybody else. Is that correct? That's correct. In fact, you knew the parents, and you, you were held accountable because you were closest to the parents in that school. And if you did something that stepped out of line from what the parents wanted in that community, they could come talk to you, and they probably did on a regular basis. That is correct. So I'm, I'm confused. When we deal with education on the federal level, we seem to always want to push education up to the federal government and have the federal government impose more and more mandates. So my question to you is, under your administration as Secretary of the Education, what have you done to push more authority and control and power down to the parents and the local school districts? Thank you for that question. I, I, the same values that I had as a fourth grade teacher and as a school principal I have here. As a matter of fact, when I was at the local level and even at the district and state level, I preferred that the decisions be made at the local level. Uh, I think that's where it should be. What we are doing is we're providing grants and uh, we're funding local boards. We're building capacity of local boards and working and partnering with them to make sure that we stay within our lane and stay in our role. As a matter of fact, the, the question you asked me about the Parents' Bill of Rights, I've been providing parents that same those rights since I was a teacher and principal. What that bill does is provide greater role for federal government to monitor local school decisions. So, so I take it by your opposition to the Parents' Bill of Rights that you're for getting the federal government out of local school districts and letting local school districts actually perform on the local level as opposed to having more oversight from the federal government. Our country was designed uh, to have local control and, and school boards and that's I, something I that's love important. to hear you say that because, and you just gave me the two examples of the things I think I thought you were going to say about what the role of federal government is uh, here in the education and primarily it's grants and funding. Is that an accurate statement? 
and um, protecting the civil rights of students. Is there, uh, of those three things, so grants funding and protecting the civil rights of students, do you believe that uh, states are ill-equipped to do that on their own? I believe uh, states sometimes need support and guidance uh, to do that work uh, successfully. Um, do you believe that there's a state presently that cannot actually protect the civil rights of students or provide funding or grants to local school districts so that they could decide locally how best to use that money? Uh, I'd be happy to have my team follow up with you on some of the work that we're doing in the Office for Civil Rights to support states and, and districts uh, accomplish that work. And, and I'm proud that we can be a partner with states uh, and districts to get that work done. Do you agree that uh, me as a representative from East Texas probably doesn't know local school districts in California or New York nearly the way those folks know their school districts and their communities? Would you agree with that? I would agree that that makes sense, that you and know your districts more than you know districts in other parts of right. the country. Right. I grew up in East Texas. I, I know East Texas. And conversely, the folks from California and New York, even the ones from Republican districts, don't know East Texas near as well as I do. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. Have you ever been to an East, Te East Texas school district? I've been to Texas a uh, number of times. I don't recall specifically w which districts they were off the top of my head, but uh, I'm sure it's a, a wonderful district, and I'm sure the local officials there are doing a great job educating students. I agree. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Ms. Wilson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for coming today. Of course. And thank you so much for coming to Miami earlier this month to highlight career technical education and after-school programs at two of the nation's best public schools, Dr. Frederica S. Wilson Skyway Elementary School, which also has the Frederica S. Wilson Boys and Girls Club on campus, and William H. Turner Technical Arts High School. At Turner Tech, Secretary Cardona met students as they learned to become electricians, nurses, farmers, veterinarians, plumbers, and music producers. I want to thank Principal Frazier and his staff for the outstanding work. The $43 million increase in federal career and technical education funding included in the President's FY24 budget ensures the prosperity of these individual programs in my district and across the nation. We rolled out the red carpet as Secretary Cardona visited Dr. Frederick S. Wilson Skyway Elementary School the birthplace of the 5,000 Role Models of Excellence Mentoring and Dropout Prevention Program, which has empowered boys of color for more than 30 years. He met grown men who came through the program. Our own Deputy Superintendent of Schools is a product. Within the halls of that school, we held a roundtable to underscore the importance of federal investments in mentoring and after-school programs. I want to thank Principal James and her team for their outstanding work. I commend President Biden and Secretary Cardona for their unwavering support of mentoring and after-school programs in the fiscal year 2024 budget. The key to our collective success lies in early investments in our children's education. We can do this by creating robust universal pre-K and compulsory kindergarten programs on a national scale. As the ranking member of the Higher Education and Workforce Development Subcommittee, I'm very concerned about the impact of restarting the federal student loan repayment program. The integrity of our higher education system is at risk. As delinquency and default rates, default rates are projected to skyrocket after payments are restarted. I look forward to working with the Secretary and my colleagues to cancel student debt and increase federal assistance for students. With that, Mr. Secretary, I have a few questions. There is a teacher shortage, and it's getting worse. People, <coughs> parents are telling their children, you will not become a teacher. In a recent survey conducted by McKinsey and Company, Teachers cited salary as the number one reason for considering departing the profession. For that reason, I sponsored the American Teacher Act, supporting state efforts to establish a minimum $60,000 teacher salaries endorsed by the NEA and the AFT. 
Can you please elaborate on the Education Department's commitment to addressing the teacher shortage through existing federal programs? Thank you. Uh, thank you for such a wonderful visit, and I appreciate what I saw there, uh, community coming together, uh, multiple generations coming together for the students. That mentorship program was great. The career pathway program there was amazing. Uh, I loved how connected it was to the careers that exist in that community. We don't have a teacher shortage issue. We have a teacher respect issue in this country. And if we're not going to be bold to address it, we're, we are at the doorstep of another crisis in our schools. Our teachers have proven time and time and again that they will do what they need to do for students. And what we have done as a country is not honor them the way they should be honored. Um, I call it the ABCs of teaching. We need to provide our teachers with agency, treat them like professionals, um, make sure that we're listening to them, take into account their perspective. Second to parents, they know the students most. B is better working conditions, which means having mental health support for students available, having professional development opportunities for teachers to grow in their career and have career options for them as well. And then C, competitive salaries. We've, we've created a condition where teachers feel guilty talking about salary. That's, that's unacceptable. Teachers are making, on average, 20% less than people with similar degrees. We need to come together to support our educators uh, with more than just coffee on Teacher Appreciation Week. We need to make sure we have competitive salaries. In our budget, we are putting dollars toward pathway programs, pipeline programs. I talked earlier about apprenticeship programs. Name another profession where you have to work for four months for free, full time. Student teachers have to do that. This is why we're having a hard time recruiting. We have work to do there, and we're committed to it. Thank you. Mr. Sh Ms. Chavez Dereamer, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's nice to meet you. I'm thank Lori you. Chavez Dreamer, representing Oregon's 5th District. Good to meet you. Uh, from some of the testimony I've heard today, I know we're not going to agree on everything, but from a lot of what you said, it encourages me to want to build a working relationship uh, with you in this role. Because I think at the end of the day, we're going to share the same goals, setting up our nation's kids for success. In Oregon, high schools are no longer required to demonstrate that each of their kids are graduating with the ability to read and write at their grade level. That doesn't set our kids up for success. If they can't read at a high school level, how are they supposed to understand their rights as workers or compare job offers? If they can't write at a high school level, how can we expect them to negotiate pay or apply for new jobs? So Mr. Secretary, what happens when kids graduate high school without being able to read or write at a level needed for navigating their professional life? Thank you uh, for the question, Congresswoman. Great to meet you, and I look forward to working with you as well. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, if basic literacy uh, is not met, if uh, math functioning is not met, we could talk about pathways all we want, but our students are not going to be able to take those careers and, and go on to college. So basic literacy and numeracy uh, is critical for students to be successful. So following up to that, um, is it serving our kids, whether they're from Oregon or any state, to bring their high schools down to standards where students don't need to graduate with these basic necessary skills? Yeah. Well, while I can't speak specifically to what was done in, in your state, um, I'd be happy to have conversation with you about that uh, at, a, at another time. I will say that what we need to be doing, and which is why we called it Raise the Bar, we need to be raising the bar. The performance of our students uh, was made worse by the pandemic, but it was nothing to brag about before the pandemic. We believe our students should be leading the world, and our plan to raise the bar includes uh, rigor in academics, high standards, ensuring that students have good, well-rounded, comprehensive educations so they can choose to go on to two-year school, four-year school, or join the workforce. They have options. Kids avoid these situations irrespective of their state's policies. When teachers and parents have great and communicative relationships, both parties working together is in the best interest of the student, I believe. Mr. Secretary, would you agree that in parent-teacher relationships, teachers should provide deference to the parents? <clears throat> I do believe that uh, teachers and parents should be working very closely together, and it should be a proactive relationship, not just when there are issues. Uh, there should be times where uh, teachers can get to know the parents. The more you know the parents, the more you know uh, how to help the child. 
Should parents have the ability to provide teachers with direct feedback about what they're teaching? Yeah, I believe those processes do exist uh, where there's ongoing communication and if there are concerns or, I mean, in the past I've had parents uh, ask me if it's possible to share a little bit of uh, you know, reading materials on a particular topic that was of interest to the student to help re-engage the student at, at a better, in a better way. So I do believe that that's something that should happen. That makes sense to me. If a child's being bullied or has a drastic change in behavior, should teachers be transparent with parents about what they are observing at school? Through uh, ongoing communication that should be existing already, yes. Also in your testimony, you mentioned that high schools need to set up students for success in pursuing a college diploma or technical and career. I mean, I think, and I would agree with you 100%, you're hitting the nail on the head for sure. But as you know, a lot of students would want to pursue technical and career, can't use the Pell Grants to cover mm. short-term programs, which prepare them for the necessary skills to thrive in technical and career. I know it is mentioned in your budget, um, but are you supportive of increasing Pell Grant eligibility to those short-term programs? Yeah, I've, I've frequently said, and if we're asking our schools and districts to evolve, um, we need to evolve also. And I, I'm interested in looking at ways to expand it to short-term Pell with increased accountability to make sure that the students are getting a benefit from it. But I am open to that, yes. And my final question, is this an area that you will commit uh, to working with the committee on then? Absolutely. Okay. Well, I look forward to working with you. I appreciate you being here today. And with that, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I recognize now uh, Mr. Bowman for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it's great to see you. Thank you so much you. for being here. Uh, thank you for your continued stellar service and congratulations on an amazing career. It's not often where you get to meet a Secretary of Education that actually taught in our classrooms, led schools as a principal, worked as a superintendent and led an entire state. So you really have moved up the ranks. Thank you, Thank you. so much for your service. I wanna zoom out for a moment because the Republican uh, proposed budget seeks to cut $4.5 trillion overall, which will obviously have a huge impact uh, on education. And while Republicans continue to speak about these budget cuts, they do not also speak about increased spending to invest more in our children and our families. So they supported the Trump tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans a few years ago and are now unwilling to even discuss making sure the wealthy among us contribute their fair share to the American economy and to education. We have a current economic system where two of the wealthiest Americans own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the country combined. So the wealthy are not contributing their fair share and large corporations are not contributing their fair share, whereas at the same time, we're talking about budget cuts. So we're not having honest, holistic, uh, comprehensive conversations. And it seems the party, the Republican Party, is, is going through a sort of cognitive dissonance where on the one hand, they're speaking about caring about student learning, whereas on the other hand, their budget proposal will cut hundreds of thousands of teachers from our classrooms. On the one hand, they're speaking about caring about student me mental health, where on the other hand, their budget proposal will cut thousands of mental health professionals from being in our schools. Their budget would also cut the arts and music and sports programs, not just in the Bronx and Mount Vernon in my district, but also in Arkansas, Ohio, Michigan, Florida, and will hurt not just urban black and brown kids, but rural white kids as well. Rural white kids love music. They would love to learn how to play an instrument. They would love to have theater, drama, and arts programs in their schools, and they would love to participate in a holistic, comprehensive education program. But unfortunately, because local property taxes fund our schools more than anything else, wealthy kids can take it. So it's very frustrating for me to sit here as a lifelong educator to listen to Republicans who do not have one former educator in their party on this committee talk about 
what we need to be doing in our schools and what we need to be doing when it comes to education. So it's incredibly frustrating that they are not being honest. They call themselves patriots. They call themselves patriots. They claim to love America. How can they love America when they are not investing in our most precious resource, which is our children? If you really love America, you want to see America grow and thrive for decades to come. The best way to do that is to make sure our children and families have everything they need. At the same time, they want to cut SNAP benefits. They want to cut $4 billion from Title I schools. These are the poorest, most vulnerable people. If we put them in desperate situations, they will turn to doing something that will harm their community, which is crime. Their budget also cuts hundreds of thousands of law enforcement officers. So now we don't have the resources to respond to our kids on the front end or the back end, and we're leaving our families to suffer. My question is this. Speak to us about the impact of these cuts and how they'll contribute to the school-to-prison pipeline, and talk about how community schools can be a response to that. Sure. You know, the gentleman the has 20 seconds. As the president said, show me your budget and I'll show you your values. It costs more to intervene and incarcerate than it does to educate. Uh, we're either going to pay now or pay later. We need to invest in our children and invest in our country. Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you. Um, I now recognize Mr. Desaigne for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Secretary. It's a pleasure to you. see you and have you here with your experience. Uh, I want to talk about mental health. You've talked about a lot here today. Uh, last session, we passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And um, last session, I was able to get the Mental Health Matters Act out of the House, not in bipartisan fashion. Um, not able to get it through the Senate. So first, on the Bipartisan, Bipartisan Safer Communities Act that was enacted, uh, any feedback you have so far in your enactment trying to get more of those, I know it's early, sure. uh, resources to the schools. And I put this in the context of two things you've mentioned. For years, I've gone out to school districts in my district in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's a very diverse district, very wealthy districts, very poor ones. The two things I hear regularly from rank and file educators, administrators and teachers is first your comment about respect. Young people who say they chose to be teachers in a high cost area like where you're from and it's, their frustration is their passion for it but their lack of respect from the larger community and their mental health. So I regularly hear from administrators and teachers and parents what they need is more counselors. So. What do, you, what do you see as successes, early successes, in Bipartisan Safer Communities Act? And on the Mental Health Matters Act, and continue to have discussions with my friend, the chair, on how we could do more around this about attracting young people in the mental health fields. Since parity in the ACA, we have over 300% increase in adults and kids asking for mental health resources. We have a unfortunately inverse response from people choosing to go in the field. I recently had a meeting with some people who have $350,000 worth of debt from the Wright Institute in Berkeley, California, near my district. They have no professional lifetime of actually getting that. So the two questions are, in the first bill, what do you see as success as early as it may be? In the second bill, how do we deal with the dilemma of the good news is stigma is going, is getting healthier about particularly young people for accessing, but we have these huge demands and we don't really have a thoughtful way to get young people to go into the profession to meet the needs. Thank you for that. And you know, I, I feel optimistic, uh, sir. You know, career pathways and mental health support for students seems to be something that everyone agrees needs to happen. The Bipartisan uh, Safer Communities Act provides a necessary funding to help double the number of social workers, counselors. Um, it provides the support and immediate uh, needs that our schools are having. Teachers, principals, parents, they all agree that these dollars are needed. Uh, it, 
red and blue states, it's something that we know we need to do better, and thankfully the funding is there for that. So I am seeing uh, this becoming an issue that unifies people and, and brings people together around the needs of our students and our educators, and I appreciate you mentioning that. I recently spoke to teachers at the Department of Education just for a focus group, and they said, you know, please don't forget we're dealing with the same mental health issues our students are facing. Sometimes we have displaced trauma, so please make sure that your plan includes us. I, I, I respect that. With regard to the shortage, uh, we have to think outside the box. If we do what we've done, we're only gonna get what we've gotten, and that's not good enough. We have to create pathway programs. We have to work with our higher education institutions to work with K-12 uh, districts to find pathways and start tapping our freshmen and sophomores in high school and asking them to consider a career in the mental health space and provide pathways for that. Our Augusta Hawkins grant does that. The work we're doing around apprenticeships does that. And we're continuing to look for ways to lift up examples of where that works. Uh, to follow up on this, we've got great research on, I mean, in the last 20 years, we've learned more about neuroscience and the development of cog cognitive uh, development successfully. Um, recently talked to Susan Lin, a Harvard researcher mm -hmm. who wrote Who's Minding Our Kids? The Effect of Social right. Media. Another wonderful researcher at Stanford, another woman, uh, wrote Dopamine Nation. I meet with her next week. So we have all these amazing, this amazing knowledge, unlike anything probably right. in the history of our species but we're not taking that research and deploying it for some of the reasons we just mentioned. What can we do with this committee in a bipartisan Thank you. fashion to work with you to get that kind of overview? You're absolutely right. One of the challenges we have is turning uh, research into practice. And what we're trying to do is uh, provide guidance in real terms and make sure we're listening to educators, parents, so that our guidance is reflective of their needs, not policy at a 50,000 foot view level. Thank you. I yield back. I hope I get a gold star. <laughs> you're pushing. You're pushing. <laughs> um, I, we're going to go vote and then come back. We have some members on our side who will be coming back after votes. Uh, would you Would you like to go, Miss O'Moore, before we go vote? Or okay. You recognize for five minutes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, thank you um, for all that you are doing to advance um, education in, in this country. Uh, I feel like our education system is under assault. Uh, in many states, there are drastic measures that are being taken that is going to make it hard for a lot of our kids to feel as if they are part of a community and can receive the education that they need in order to be able to succeed. There are organizations um, like Moms for Liberty, I call them Moms for Dictatorship, for disrespect, for disinformation, um, for abuse, for harassment, for bullying, because many of the things that they are advocating for uh, is to create an environment where a lot of our kids feel intimidated, a lot of our kids feel as if they are not living in an open, inclusive society. When we think about the meaning of liberty, we think about liberty and the pursuit of happiness, letting people achieve their dreams and be able to exist as they wish to exist in this country and around the world. So I want to hear what the Department of Education is doing to push back against some of this discourse, some of the legislation that's being proposed in Florida and in Texas. We saw that there was a legislation that was asking for young women to um, disclose when they were menstruating. I cannot imagine the level the level of disrespect that a child might feel or my daughters might feel when a teacher or administrator wants to get some information that is so personal for them. So what, what is the Department of Education doing? Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. And yes, we also feel that um, students who are most in need of support are often targeted uh, 
by uh, folks and made to feel that they're not welcome or accepted for who they are. Yeah. Um, Does the Department of Education have tools to push back against that or do you need legislation yeah. to help we, you do that? Uh, clearly legislation would, would help and we would be, uh, uh, you know, implementing legislation, but we have provided more fact sheets and documents around uh, the rights of educators, the rights of education leaders, um, the responsibilities that they have. We've uh, made sure that our Office for Civil Rights is responsive and clear around uh, what role they provide. Our Office of Elementary and Secondary Education has provided um, countless uh, documents and uh, clarity around what the roles and responsibilities are of boards and, and state officials, um, and we've stood up and used our position to make sure we made it clear that all students should be respected, all students should be seen and, well, and valued for who they are. Um, and we're gonna continue to do that. We recognize uh, many of our students are under attack, especially our most vulnerable students, and we have the responsibility to stand up for those students, whether it's through op-eds, using the bully pulpit, uh, clarifying uh, fact sheets. Yeah, uh, thank you. We, we've, we've done our part and we're gonna continue. Yeah. I also want to um, congratulate you on the student debt cancellation that the administration um, has uh, implemented. Uh, I know that there are uh, some challenges um, uh, in, in the court. I want to, to ask if there is an update. And also, um, once you are in the clear, does the department have the resources, the manpower, uh, to be able to carry it out as um, effectively, yeah. efi efficiently as possible. Thank you for that. Um, we are excited about the one-time targeted debt relief that's going to help 43 million Americans. Uh, we look forward to a positive decision from the Supreme Court. Um, and we are geared up, ready to go. We recognize it's never been done before to bring on up to 43 million people back to repayment. Um, the, the student aid office is ready. Um, we want to be more responsive than we've been in the past and make sure that we provide good service. I will say that if the budget proposal that we have here is not supported, it would significantly impact our ability to serve the 43 million borrowers. It would affect our ability to, to serve those students who are going to be eligible for FAFSA. Um, we anticipate over 600,000 more students having access to higher education with our better FAFSA. Wonderful, uh, and we look forward yeah. to making sure you have the resources that you. you need and that Republicans Thank do you. not succeed uh, in stopping you from this effort, completing you. this effort. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Comer, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. I've written you several times over the last few months, uh, not just in my capacity as a member of the House Education Committee, but as chairman of the House Oversight Committee. Uh, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to discuss some of these issues with you today. Uh, my most recent correspondence was in conjunction with Chairwoman Fox. In that letter, we requested additional information regarding the department's plan to allow borrowers to self-certify their income for eligibility for income-driven repayment plans. Uh, the department announced these changes on January 10th of this year and has left loan administrators and borrowers without guidance on how these changes m will be implemented. We're also concerned that self-certification of income will result in fraudulent reporting. That's a priority for my House Oversight Committee, fraud. To date, my staff and I have not received a response from your letter, from our letter. Will you commit to scheduling the requested briefing the regarding the department's actions by the end of this week? Thank you, uh, uh, Congressman Comer. Um, and I do look forward to uh, having my team continue ongoing engagement. With regard to uh, the reporting of uh, income, we are working to improve the system uh, to make sure that we have the information directly from the IRS to reduce paperwork and, and make sure that the uh, information is accurate. We take the engagement with the Oversight Committee very seriously, um, and we want to make sure that we're responsive to any requests and act in good faith. So can we get a briefing from the department staff on exactly how that's being implemented? Because, you know, uh, this waste, fraud, and abuse yeah. within the whole federal government is out of control, and we try to nip it in the bud before it happens, and this looks like fraud waiting to happen here. 
Thank you. Uh, we do take that issue very seriously. I agree with you that we have to be very mindful of every dollar that is being used. I'll uh, make sure that there is a communication to your team from my team and, and okay. that we're responsive in our engagement with you. Mr. Secretary, Section 117 of the Higher Education Act currently requires institutions of higher education to disclose gifts or contracts from a foreign source valued at more than $250,000. Since 1986, gifts and contracts to uh, the U.S. Institutes of Higher Education from China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar have totaled more than $11 billion. For instance, the University of Pennsylvania, home of the infamous Pi uh, Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy, uh, where President Biden stored some of his classified documents, reported a nearly 400% increase in, fo in foreign gifts and contracts, including approximately $22 million in anonymous donations from China. Coincidentally, you recently announced the Office of Federal Student Aid would be taking over enforcement activities relating to potential one, uh, Section 117 violations, an office with little to no background in such disclosures, and indicated potential violations would have a much lower level of scrutiny. What steps has the department taken to strengthen Section 117 enforcement in the transition from the Office of General Counsel to the Office of Federal Student Loan Aid? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, we take foreign threats very seriously, um, and we will, will be responding to, to all the letters that we receive. Uh, we respect the uh, protecting uh, intellectual property here in the United States, and as, with regard to Section 117, we're improving uh, reporting. Uh, by moving it to FSA and building capacity, we've gotten over 34,000 public filings already. We're on pace to have the most in any other administration. We take it very seriously. And, and let me say this before I would like to yield the balance of my time to the ch chair, but we've got a problem with our universities, according to multiple university presidents I've spoken with, that we have Chinese students that are stealing our intellectual property. They're essentially serving as spies for the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, we have certain universities that are receiving enormous anonymous gifts mm -hmm. from the Chinese Communist Party. This is a concern for the House Oversight Committee. With that, Madam Chair, I yield the balance of my time. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, as I mentioned in our, I want to follow up on, on the, what uh, Congressman Comer is talking about. As I mentioned in our call last week, We've transmitted to the department several oversight letters with requests for information. Right now, we, some we've received no response. With others, we've received minimal response. And nearly all the letters were late, and most of them, the requests for documents have been ignored. Without objection, I submit for the record a summary chart of the letters and the status of each the letters we sent to the department and the response letters we received where they exist and the instructions the committee provided to the department for responding to the letters. And as Mr. Comer has suggested, we will continue to press for the answers to the questions that we're asking and the information that we need. Will you commit to responding fully and promptly to all the letters I've indicated in the chart? Uh, thank you, Chair Fox. We take it very seriously uh, it, to be uh, responsive. I just need a yes or a no. I do commit to make sure that we continue to respond to your letters in a timely way and in good faith. Yes. Thank you very much. With that, I recognize Mr. Mervan for five minutes. Thank you, Secretary Cardona. Uh, in March 2021, I was proud to support the House package of the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, this historic investment is our nation's K-12 education system enabled school districts, teachers, staff, and students to weather the novel challenges posed by the pandemic. My home state of Indiana received over $1.9 billion from this law. Specifically, local educational agencies were able to leverage these funds to strengthen teacher development and preparation programs, as well as provide educators with competitive, <laughs> livable salaries. What data has the department collected about how states and districts are using the RP funds? Thank you, um, Congressman. And thank you for the support of the American Rescue Plan dollars. Without question, that was a lifeline for our schools in my conversations and my travels to over 40 states and territories, 
without question, that helped get our students reconnected to schools. It helped colleges stay open. There are a lot of colleges that would have closed. Um, in the K-12 space, uh, over 50% of the dollars were used for staffing and academic recovery. 23% uh, on school infrastructure. What that means is basically um, addressing deferred maintenance on the air circulation system. Quite frankly, I visited some districts where the system hadn't been touched in over 10 years, and they had to basically gut it and start it from scratch. The American Rescue Plan dollars helped that happen. Mental health supports was another area where uh, those dollars were critical. Um, you know, we, as you know, we're in a youth mental health crisis right now. If it weren't for those dollars, we'd be dealing with much worse data on uh, the condition of our youth. Uh, so it has been used. We put, because we want to make sure we're clear where the dollars are being used, we put on our website, www.ed.gov, uh, a link on the opening page, ARP data transparency, where you could see how the dollars were used in every district. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the mental health accessibility, the ability to uh, invest in HVAC systems that could uh, help uh, with viruses, to be able to clear that air to get schools back, or children back in schools was a vital part of that. So I appreciate that. The second part of my question is, can you describe how the President's budget's proposal will build upon the investment to support diverse and highly, qual highly qualified educator workforce? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we have to recognize that sustaining a highly qualified workforce is critical if we're serious about our students improving in reading and math, if we're serious about students finding pathways to career and college. It all starts with making sure that we have a highly qualified workforce and retaining a highly qualified workforce. Our budget proposal includes measures to um, drill down and make uh, uh, fund pathway programs that are um, grow your own program. So for example, in a community, you might have a paraeducator who's supporting students, or you might have uh, parents who might have a degree in something else but don't have a degree in teaching, recruiting them, creating a pathway for them to get to the teaching credentials, and then going back into the district. Uh, we have a program called the Augusta Hawkins uh, Grant that does that uh, to help diversify the teaching profession. We're working very um, intently on making sure we expand apprenticeship programs. Currently, student teachers work for four months without getting paid. We have to fix that. If we're gonna recruit and retain teachers, we have to make sure that the teaching profession is viewed like other professions and you get paid while you do that. So we're, we went from two states that have uh, apprenticeship programs, we're up to 16, we wanna to get to 50. We wanna make sure that we're helping we want to work with four-year institutions to make sure that they're working more closely with K-12 districts so we could be tapping freshmen and sophomores on the shoulders and saying, you should be a teacher like I was tapped on the shoulder. So coming from a heavy labor force or mm -hmm. labor organized district, just elaborate a little bit more on the apprenticeship program for the teachers and what that means. Yeah. <clears throat> Much like in some of the trade industries, we have uh, a young uh, person or a, a new person learning skills from someone that has done the job for a long time, we want to make sure that we have apprenticeship programs for teachers as well. You learn best by doing with a seasoned mentor that knows the ins and outs. That coupled with pedagogy instruction at the university level is the best pathway. Uh, right now our systems are designed where uh, for, in many cases our pre-service teachers don't get into the classroom until their last year of the profession, we have to change that to make sure that they're prepared and connected to the students that they're gonna serve. I thank you, Mr. Secretary, you. and I appreciate you looking at it from the perspective of drawing more equitable teachers into that field and also doing what you can to bring in uh, and, and change that profession for the better. Yeah, thank thank you. you. With that, I yield back my time, Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Mervan. Mr. Secretary, we are going to go vote and then we will be back. Thank you.
Um, I want to thank everyone for their patience in coming back, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for waiting uh, for us. I now recognize Mr. Estes for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam uh, Chair, and uh, thank you, Secretary, for, for joining us today. It's so important for us to, uh, on the legislative branch, to be involved so much in the activities of the, of the department. And uh, you know, the, I know there's a whole list of issues that we could go over, and, and one of the things I wanted to make sure that uh, uh, some of the questions other folks had, they had an opportunity to cover. So I want to I want yield my time to the speaker, or to the chair, so she can uh, uh, ask some more of the questions I know she has in depth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Estes. Mr. Secretary, I have one more um, question as a follow-up to what we were discussing earlier mm -hmm. on the letters and that other people have expressed their concern about. Could we get you to commit to fully responding in the future to letters and requests we transmit in accordance with the instructions? I think you indicated that earlier, but I'd like to get a clear response from you on that. Sure, Chair uh, Fox. We, we certainly do take that very seriously, and we, I commit that our department will respond to letters and uh, provide the information that we can provide you uh, in good faith. And now I would like to turn to a positive note. Um, you, you've mentioned, you know, how you would like us to work in a bipartisan manner. Others have done that. We had a hearing on WIOA the other day that was very bipartisan, and. Um, we think one area of bipartisan support that we find in the committee is support for workforce Pell, or some call it short-term mm -hmm. Pell. We like to call it workforce Pell. Uh, I introduced the Pell Act, which requires short-term programs to meet strong guardrails to ensure students receive a return on their investment. Importantly, the Pell Act does not exclude any types of providers or high-quality online education. My belief is if a provider can meet the guardrails, who are we to take away high quality education options for the students? I'm thrilled that Ranking Member Scott has also introduced his own proposal, which does not exclude for-profit providers. 16 other House Democrats also joined in supporting Workforce Pell that allows high quality for-profit providers to participate. And as I said, we had a really good hearing on um, the workforce issues. So now that there seems to be some agreement on a path forward, will the department support Workforce Pell for all? Yes, thank you for that. I said earlier today that I feel if we're asking our institutions. Microphone, excuse me. Okay, if we're asking our institutions to evolve to meet the students' needs, we too need to be thinking about different ways to meet the demand. I look forward to hearing more about it and engaging and working in bipartisan fashion to support the, uh, the legislation, thank you. And I'll just add one more comment to that in terms of, again, I'm always very sensitive to language and how we're talking about things. Um, I think most people want to get degrees or certification to get a job. So we're not just talking about community college. We're not, uh -huh. we're not talking about baccalaureate. We're talking about all kinds of opportunities for people, sure. I think, here. And I think it's best if we talk about a continuum. Mm -hmm. And I know you've alluded to that. So, Thank you very much. We look forward to working with you. I yield back to Mr. Estes, who I think is going to yield to Mr. Owens. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll yield the remainder of my time to, uh, to Mr. Owens. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just wanted to, I guess, spend a, just a few minutes to represent those voices of the millions of uh, Americans who have been left behind over the last few years. Um, we talked about Baltimore. There's an there's a article here, 23 schools. Uh, zero proficiency in math. That's right here in our shadows this, this, this last year. Uh, I've talked about often the 75 percent of black boys in the state of California that uh, the Department of Education said could not read and write. Uh, these, these are the real, real Americans outside of our bubble. And I know it's nice to kind of come here, we talk about bipartisan, we can kind of talk flowery words, but there are people that are actually dying today, hopelessness, uh, no desire to move forward because they're not getting educated. Uh, <clears throat> Let me, let me ask you this. Uh, first of all, what type of schools would you take a look at for your children to go to? Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Congressman Owens. I agree with you. Uh, that level of urgency. No, I, I, don't, I don't have a few minutes. So, I, sure. so what's, what, what type of schools would you, would private, would parochial, would uh, charter, would public, what would be the options you would give yourself if you were trying to find the best school for My your wife kids? and I would 
look at all options. My children okay. attend public schools. I attended public okay. schools. Now, now let me ask you this. I'm sorry because we're all running out of time. Mm -hmm. If your children, who you love dearly, who is there, where you vision their great things like we all do, found themselves in a place like this where the schools are failing, what would you do to get them out of that? Sir, I guess the best way to look at it is as Secretary of Education, I have responsibility no, 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 for I'm, 65 I'm sorry. I'm, I'm million I'm going to break this down. I'm sorry. I'm going to break it down to those who are listening that are going through what we're dealing with right now today. This kind of pick, take away the, the titles. What would you do as a parent if you found yourself in this situation like millions of black right. and, and Hispanic kids are doing every single day and they have no choice? So what would you, how would you handle that? I would advocate for the president's budget. Would that be choice? I would advocate for funding schools so that those students could have access to success as would well. Would that be all schools? I mean, I know these schools here have enough money. This, this school here, 21,000 per, per child. 21,000 is Baltimore school, so it's not the school, it's not the money, it's failure of a system. So we, giving them more money would not be the, the key. Would you give them choice to get out? When you have choice, sir? Would you give, would you give, would you give yourself choice to get out? Your, your children to get out of that situation, would you do something to choose to get away from that or just because the system is there, you just go with it? Make sure we improve the, the local schools as well. I want to make sure that wherever my kids go to school, they have success. Okay, so you'll stay there. Okay, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, just know I would never do that to my children. Never, ever. Okay, just so you know. Uh, I yield back. I now recognize Ms. Houchin for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Thank you for your testimony. I'm going to, in the spirit of time, just go through a few yes or no questions, Mr. Secretary. Um, as you know, the House and this committee have passed the Protection of Women and Girls Sports Act in an effort to protect Title IX, which the Department of Education has failed to do. As a parent of two female student athletes, I have a vested interest in this issue. Do you believe that requiring those women to undress in front of Leah Thomas and allowing Leah Thomas to undress in front of female athletes constitutes sexual harassment, yes or no? I don't believe students should be, uh, feel unsafe in any locker room. Do you believe that it constitutes sexual harassment to force women to undress in front of biological males? I do believe uh, forcing uh, women to undress in front of biological males is a concern and a sexual, yes. So if Thomas identified as male, would requiring female swimmers to dress with him have constituted sexual harassment? Can you repeat the question? If Leah Thomas identifies as male, would requiring female swimmers to dress with him have constituted sexual harassment? I, I think I know the line of questioning, and I'd be happy say, to entertain. Just say yes or no. Uh, it's not a yes or no question for me. It is because a yes or no question. Is it sexual harassment or not? You can continue down. You can use your time to go down okay. that line of if questioning. If female athletes are sidelined from participation in women's sports or are denied awards or other recognition only because a male who self-identifies as a girl competes in the sport, does this constitute sex discrimination under Title IX? I'd be happy to discuss the merits of our proposal and hear your concerns about the policy, but this line of questioning yes where- Yes or no, do you think that female athletes sidelined from participation in women's sports, if they're denied awards or recognition because a male who identifies as a girl competes in the sport, does that constitute sex discrimination under Title IX, yes or no? I believe the uh, harassment and discriminations against transgender students is something that is rampant in this country. And as a department, we're proposing uh, regulations to make sure that all students are seen and valued for who they are and given the same opportunities So under to Title IX, under, your in, under that interpretation, uh, uh, under, are you admitting then that Title IX, under your interpretation, no longer protects female athletes' equal opportunity on the basis of sex? I'm proud of the work we're doing to make sure okay. all students feel valued and seen in schools. And uh, there are students right now that are hurting because elected officials have chosen to use their platform to further ostracize them. And we take why pride in making proposed, sure Why schools, have you proposed regulation that will, under some circumstances, require schools and colleges to commit acts of sex discrimination under Title IX by per permitting biological men to take the place of female athletes in women's sports? If you look at our proposed Title IX regulations, it doesn't do that. What it does is prevent blanket bans on students who are transgender and allows students to participate in co-curricular activities which are part of the uh, education process. But if those uh, biological males are required to uh, dress with female athletes, does that constitute sexual harassment? Are you referring to transgender girls? Yes. I believe transgender uh, girls have uh, should have access to uh, all the experiences that 
public schools provide. Why is it not, uh, why do you not feel that female athletes should be protected from sexual harassment? All athletes should be protected from sexual harassment. But what you're saying is contradictory. Okay, I'm going to move on to um, free speech. The suppression of conservative speech has been an ongoing issue. Over 60% of students in a recent survey believe the political and social climate on their college campuses prevents free speech and expression. Yet earlier this year, the department questioned the necessity of the free inquiry rule that protects students' rights to free speech on their campuses and allows courts to hold institutions in violation accountable. Do you believe that violations of free speech are not happening on college campuses? Free speech is the foundation for higher education and we support it 100%. Uh, the department can only act after the court rules that uh, a public institute of higher education has violated the First Amendment. Yet, Secretary Cardona, your department is questioning the effectiveness of the rule before the legal process established by the rule has ever been carried out. We believe in free speech and the importance of protecting, uh, protecting the free speech on college campuses. Your department has also questioned if the free inquiry rule has detrimental effects that seem contradictory. How can you rule, have a rule, how can a rule have detrimental effects if no cases have been ruled on by a judge yet and no final judgments have been transmitted to the department to act on? I'd be happy to have my uh, department reach back out to you to share information about it. And um, I'm proud of the fact that we're protecting the, the freedom of speech uh, that our students have on, court, uh, Thank on you. higher education institutions. Thank you. I yield the remainder of my time to the chair. Thank you. I yield to Mr. Mr. Ms. Smucker for five minutes. Sorry about that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for yielding. And uh, thank you, Secretary, for um, uh, coming before the committee and answering uh, some of our questions. Uh, one of the, I think, most pressing issues today is um, President Biden's student debt bailout, which is uh, deeply unfair uh, to a majority of middle class Americans. Uh, in my um, district, only 17 uh, and a half percent of people in, uh, have a bachelor's degree. Uh, Sixty-three percent of my constituents have no college degree at all. And so essentially what the bailout is doing, asking my constituents to subsidize uh, the education of others. According to the National Taxpayers Union, the, the cost of debt cancellation and your proposed income-driven repayment plan will cost each American taxpayer uh, $3,527. And so uh, I find it simply unacceptable that you would ask uh, my constituents who do not have a college degree and millions more across the country to shoulder that burden for individuals who knew what they were getting into, who signed their own name to a, a federal college loan. Um, so just wonder if you care to respond to that. Thank you, uh, Congressman. I want to make sure it's very clear that the targeted debt relief, 90% uh, of the dollars would go to people making less than $75,000. It's to help uh, middle class Americans and those who are struggling get back on their feet as a result of the pandemic. I make it analogous to uh, small business, the PPP loans uh, that help keep those businesses afloat. It's because of the pandemic and it's a one-time uh, payment. Um, what it's intended to do is prevent defaults from happening uh, we were projecting a significant number of defaults in loans, which is bad for the entire community uh, in which those people live. So what we're trying to do is provide targeted debt relief. The overwhelming majority of people that would get it are making less than $75,000. I, I can tell you, I'll just uh, restate, uh, in talking to my constituents, mm -hmm. uh, they, they see it as very unfair uh, to themselves. They believe that people have gone into this knowing what they were getting into, and, and they've made choices uh, based on what they wanted to do in their own lives and the direction they wanted to go, and they feel like they're being held responsible uh, for others. We, I, we did send a letter, I, I signed on to a letter by the, with the chairwoman expressing concern that uh, the department's outside auditor, KPMG, uh, was unable to give an audit opinion because of uh, your insufficient evidence to back up the cost estimates and the take-up rate uh, for the student loan bailout plan. And in fact, KPMG had to issue a disclaimer of opinion, which uh, I believe is the first time in 20 years that the department received uh, this kind of disclaimer. Um, how can taxpayers trust uh, 
your Department of Education to spend their money wisely uh, if you and your staff can't even account uh, for how much money you're spending? Thank you for the question. Uh, I want to just make a very quick comment. Uh, the President has already reduced the deficit by more than $1.7 trillion, and we're on uh, projecting a $3 trillion deficit reduction in the next 10 years with this budget uh, with reference to the context of the student loan forgiveness. With regard to the audit, um, the disclaimer was not a negative assessment, as you know. Uh, it was done because there was never in the history of our department an attempt to do what we're doing to provide targeted debt relief. So it was more a disclaimer. We do take a fiscal responsibility uh, very seriously at the Department of Education, and we will continue to do that. Uh, we'll let that, uh, one other quick question I'd like to get in. I'm concerned about the initiation of loan repayment after three years of pause, uh, pause payments. Uh, the right. department has lost experienced servicers, and those that remain face serious staffing challenges, uh, which will create difficulties, I'm afraid, for right. borrowers during the transition. Um, and I believe you confirmed in a Senate appropriations hearing uh, that the department will resume uh, those loan payments shortly after yes. uh, June 30th. However, I've heard from <laughs> constituents and servicers as well that they've received uh, no communication or guidance uh, regarding the resumption of payments. And I wondered if you could confirm that you provided the servicers with the information that they need to be prepared for repayment. Thank you for that question. And I g it gives you an opportunity to kind of support what you're saying. Yes, we're in communication regularly with our servicers, but the budget that we're proposing, if not if we don't have the funding in FSA, we're going to see extended delays. Our veterans are not going to get the services that they need in a timely way. We're not going to be able to process the FAFSA applications. So uh, your support of the funding for FSA will make sure that that on-ramp to repayment is smooth, as, as smooth as possible for our borrowers. Just one quick question. Can you commit, can you provide all communications <coughs> that you provided to servicers uh, as it pertains to uh, repayment to, uh, yeah, to this committee? thank you. Committee? I, I believe that was in one of the letters. We are working in good faith to be responsive to those letters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Smucker. Uh, Mr. Thompson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Secretary, thank you for taking the time to be here today. Much appreciated. As you noted, I believe we all share the common goal of supporting academic excell excellence for students of all ages. <laughs> but particularly for young students early on in their academic careers to build the foundation for, for success. Now, funding from the Targeted and Education Incentive Finance Grants under Title I, Part A of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act is intended to go to schools serving low-income, high-poverty areas. Now, these grants are allocated based on a complex formula that considers both the percentage and the number of disadvantaged students in a given area. As part of the Every Student Succeeds Act in 2015, Congress mandated a study on Title I funding for formulas in order to ensure that funds are actually going to the local education agencies that need them the most. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, I'd ask unanimous consent to insert into the record this 2019 report from the National Center for Education Statistics on the mathematical formula for Part A grants under Title I. Without objection. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, what this report shows is what local education agencies in my district and around the country have been saying for decades. The formula simply isn't fair. Number weighing, weighting dis disproportionately sends funds to large school districts. The report found even if they have a low percentage of poverty because of the number weighting. This leaves school districts in low income rural areas like my district on the short end of the stick. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, the, the support to offset the impact of poverty on education and learning should not be based on your zip code, it should be on your actual circumstances. So, Mr. Mr. Secretary, what do you think is the solution to address this discrepancy? Thank you, Congressman, for, for that question, for sharing that. I share, I share those beliefs. Uh, for far too long, I believe uh, our rural communities have not been identified as, as in need as they really are. In fact, the pandemic showed that our rural communities uh, were often the communities that had the least access to broadband, the least access to one-on-one -on -one devices, and to uh, highly certified teachers. We're t we take that very seriously. I visited several uh, rural communities. I've spoken to teachers, 
and parents in rural communities and, and students to hear from them directly. I'm proud to say that the Title I uh, dollars, uh, rural districts would share in the $2.2 billion increase. The rural education program in our budget has uh, $215 what, well, million. Mr. Secretary, if, if we could, you're, you're talking about new money. I'm talking about the formula. Mm. Is the formula broken? Is the formula inequitable so that it favors large school districts despite low uh, in, instance of poverty? Uh, does it favor them over, quite frankly, uh, the remaining school districts mm -hmm. that can have significantly higher proportion of poverty. Is, uh, is, is the formula broken? Mr. Thompson, I'd be happy to look at that and, and hear more from you and look into that well, because I do think... Well, I would encourage you because your department actually conducted this, mm -hmm. uh, arranged for the study at the direction of this committee. Yeah. And the study that came back says that it is broken. It's inequitable, um, you know, is the... Um, and so we, we need a, the, formal, uh, the formula for distribution really has been affirmed by the work, uh, the study that your department right. led. And so we, we need a remedy that similar to legislation I've introduced that actually caused that study to occur uh, called the ACE Act, All Children Are Equal. Mm -hmm. And certainly equal in terms of those who are living. So we're not, so it's the formula that's broken at this point. I, um, and so uh, just moving on here, uh, um, I also wanted to quickly touch on CTE programs as a co-chair of the Career and Technical Education Caucus and really a champion of, of Perkins 5. I'm proud of the bipartisan work and support that this committee has done for uh, students of all ages uh, in terms of both academic and technical skills. Um, Mr. Secretary, in the President's budget request, there's a substantial increase for CTE national programs. And while I've consistently supported robust funding for CTE programs under the Perkins formula, I remain concerned that this funding would flow outside of this formula that so many schools rely on. Has your department encountered any issues with the Perkins formula? And if not, why are you seeking to allocate additional funds outside of it, outside of the Perkins formula? Sure, thank you for that. And I just want to follow up on the previous question about rural education. We do take that seriously. We have a new director of rural engagement. We created a rural action team, and I'd be happy to share more information with That'd you. That'd be great. With regard to the uh, per Perkins program, that is the that is the foundation of the work that we're going to be doing. But we recognize, sir, that if we continue with the way we're going, we're never going to meet the demand. We're never going to meet the demand. What we need to do is not only engage in supporting state grants through Perkins, but also make sure that we're uh, providing not only funding, but support, guidance, and a push to evolve our high schools to create better college and career pathways to engage to our two-year schools and our workforce partners. That's been very well received in the states and the districts when I have conversations with governors, mayors, school superintendents who want to do the right thing, school boards, but they just need technical assistance to make sure that their schools are evolving to meet the demand. Well, I think they need the Perkins 5 formula assistance, actually. As I visit these schools, uh, these are secondary education schools, these folks have waiting lists today. So they have the programs, they're partnering with uh, those who sign the front of a paycheck, right. not the back of a paycheck, to provide the, the right type of education so that when these kids graduate, they've got a diploma and certificates in one hand, and quite frankly, have multiple job offers in the other. Yeah. Let, let's not mess this up by working outside the formula for Perkins 5. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, but I apologize for the additional time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Um, Scott, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for, uh, for being with us. Um, we've heard uh, several references to certain schools where virtually no one is up to standard. Uh, what does ESSA do for schools like this? The solution we've heard is that if you let a few people sneak out the back door, uh, they might take care of themselves. So the other 90%, of course, are stuck in a bad school with less resources. What does ESSA allow you to do, and what does your budget do to these schools that are clearly failing? You know, it, it allows for greater oversight and accountability. Um, it, it allows for us to engage uh, more uh, directly with these districts, with these states, and where possible direct where funds are gonna be used or partner with them to build capacity to meet the needs of the students. Um, as you said, the answer is not to 
give students a lottery ticket to somewhere else. It's to make sure that all schools are performing at high levels. I'm proud of the work that we're doing to what we call raise the bar around academic proficiency, reading and, and math, uh, civics, history, sciences. We need to do better if our students are gonna be prepared for these jobs. And we have a plan, sir. We have a plan to do that. And uh, happy to share it with anyone on the committee that's interested in learning more. Thank you, and I think you pointed out in response to the um, uh, decision to open schools during the pandemic, that decision is made on a local and state basis, not on a federal basis, but the federal government did provide money to Absolutely. make that happen. You mentioned uh, ventilation systems that a lot of schools had problems with, PPE, transportation money, hire nurses and counselors, uh, catch up, uh, hire extra tutors and um, uh, summer programs. Um, could you have, could these schools have opened safely without the ARPA money? You know, across the country, the schools relied on the American Rescue Plan dollars. And, you know, and we're talking about students, um, not Republican students, Democrat students, or parents. We're talking about the, the 50 million students in our K-12 schools. Uh, I've heard from red communities, blue communities, that those dollars helped safely reopen school, get the students uh, the materials that they needed, provide compensatory support after school. There were more students in summer school programs this summer than any other time in our country's history because of the American Rescue Plan dollars. All students benefited from it. Thank you. We've heard about the cost of debt cancellation, a student debt cancellation, and what it costs each taxpayer. We didn't hear the calculation for how much it costs each taxpayer uh, for the Trump tax cut, which was actually bigger and 80% of the benefits went to the top 1% in corporations. We haven't heard that calculation, um, but we have dealt with the, you have dealt with the public service loan forgiveness program under the Trump administration. Virtually no one earned their discharge when they thought because the program was so, um, so messed up. Um, how, is, how many people have benefited from the public service loan forgiveness uh, under your administration? Thank you. Uh, well, when, when we came into our positions, we were told fix this broken system, and part of that was the public service loan forgiveness, intended for teachers, for nurses, for police officers, for veterans, all those people that we were calling essential three years ago today. Well, from 2017 to 2021, when that program was in effect, 7,000 Americans benefited from it. Okay, we worked to fix that. From 2021 till today, over 600,000 people have taken advantage of it. Over $42 billion uh, in approved debt relief have been provided to teachers, to people who choose public service. So I would say it's working and it's helping keep people in those professions that we need. Well, we need to make sure the, cert the loan services are doing their job to inform people of the appropriate program they need to right. be in. I'm not satisfied that they're doing uh, what they need to be doing. Uh, are you aware of the um, Loan Act that uh, increases Pell Grants, uh, makes public service loan forgiveness more, um, more generous, and reduces interest rate? If not, uh, if you could have your staff uh, review it and get back to us, we'd, we'd appreciate it. Will do. Um, and I, I just wanted to express in the final seconds uh, the funding for mental health, Title I, early childhood education, extracurricular activities, uh, CTE, as uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania has mentioned, are all valuable, and we need to be putting more money into those programs, not less as they would be under the uh, Republican cuts. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, sir. You're back. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Scott. Mr. Williams, Williams, <coughs> you're recognized for five minutes. And Mr. Secretary, I understand this is your last uh, question. I admire you for your endurance. And I'm told that they, uh, they raise the temperature as the hearing goes on to simulate summer school. <laughs> so I think that's where we are in the cycle. Um, there are currently 56, 57 million children, K through 12, in our country today, approximately. 90% uh, of those are in our public schools, and 10% are in other forms of, uh, of education. Um, but over the last several years, sir, 
uh, we've seen, as has been well documented and noted, a shocking decline in uh, children's ability to read at grade level, to perform math at grade level. This is particularly concerning in my district where we have some of the poorest schools uh, in our nation. And as has noted by my colleagues and others, I am certain that the parents in these school districts, in the poorest of our school districts, love their children and have hope for their children every bit as much uh, as elsewhere. And so I have two fundamental questions, sir. I come out of a, a military service early in my career, and it was a very unforgiving environment of accountability for leadership. <clears throat> It concerns me that we could see such a precipitous drop in the performance of our children and uh, the, the concern that we all share for what that means, just, not just for their lives, but also for our society, for our culture, for our economy. <clears throat> and what accountability are you enforcing in your organization uh, among your leadership, uh, to what degree are you holding them responsible for this precipitous drop in performance of our children? Yeah, thank you for that question. And uh, like you, I feel a great sense of urgency of not only recovering from the impact of the pandemic, but really looking at the data from 2019 as unacceptable. Our students should be achieving at the highest levels in the world. We have a plan to address that. And our plan, we call it Raise the Bar Strategy. We, I'd be happy to share more information on it. We're focusing relentlessly on literacy, numeracy, improving STEM outcomes, and giving students a well-rounded education that prepares them for choices when they graduate, whether it's career or college. With regard to accountability, we are engaging regularly with uh, states. We are monitoring uh, their their assessment strategies, making sure that all students are being accounted for. We collect data on disparities uh, of students and make sure that uh, we call out any disparities. And more than call out, because that doesn't change behaviors, is really support and make sure that we're providing the best technical assistance possible at the Department of Education. If, if I may just bring it a little bit more to the point of my question, uh, the accountability that I'm accustomed to is that leaders are held accountable, um, not the states, not the schools, but leaders in your organization. What plan do you have to hold the leadership of the Department of Education accountable for um, this lapse, uh, including going back to 2019 and before? Yeah. Well, keep in mind that the data decline has uh, taken a couple decades to get to where we are. What we're doing is putting a plan in action that's focusing on academic rigor, uh, highly qualified teachers. If you look at our plan, it's focusing on some of the root causes. We don't have highly qualified teachers in some of our neediest, neediest areas. We're focusing not only dollars, but resources and our technical assistance on improving that. Literacy and numeracy. We're also funding uh, programs that support literacy and numeracy. Um, so while we take responsibility and we have a plan for it, we recognize that this has been decades in the making. I appreciate that, and I look forward to learning about your plan, but more importantly, we'll be watching for accountability. Um, last question, hopefully of the day, perhaps. But um, you know, I believe that children and parents and families deserve a choice in their education, and uh, I would support a model where the resources follow the child and not the institutions, particularly when we find our institutions are failing so broadly. What pilot projects, what programs, what initiatives are part of your uh, department that follow this model of school choice and um, where resources perhaps follow children, preferably in, yeah. in the most underprivileged of our neighborhoods? You know, um, we do support uh, public charter schools and we have uh, funding for that. But let me just close by saying I take very seriously as a father and as an educator my responsibility for every child's learning in this, school, in this country, and I will never support a system that has winners and losers. All students deserve to be in a high-quality school, and every parent should be able to select their local neighborhood school as a high-quality school. That's the work of the Department of Education. That's what I'm committed to as secretary. Thank you. Thank you. I think school's out, and my time's <laughs> expired. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I believe that uh, you know, takes care of all the members who are here who wish to ask questions. So, Secretary Cardona, I thank you again for coming to testify before the committee today. Um, I thank you again for your patience as we went to vote. And without objection, there being no further business, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>